and we are here. Welcome, welcome everyone to a very special episode, video, event, slash live stream. There's a couple of different things because uh, this is happening live at the moment on uh, Duratia Productions' YouTube channel, but it's also given a great opportunity. Uh, so uh, there might be some of you watching this on my channel because I'll be reposting it there as well. And what's special about this? Well, there's a very special guest. You might have recognized this handsome face off to the side of the screen. We have Nicholas Lloyd of the YouTube channel, Lindy Beige. How are you, mate? Uh, I think I'm all right, you know, despite everything. And how are you? Oh, I've been pretty darn good lately. I think for um, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of significant things happening that uh, put me in a fairly good mood. We are, of course, joined as well by the producer of the Shadow of the Conqueror short film, Dylan. How are you, mate? Thank you, Shad. I'm uh, really happy to be there with both of you. It's a, a great opportunity for all of us, I think. Absolutely. Now, this has been a bit of a long time coming because uh, of, of course, Lloyd and myself have, uh, have interacted, okay? Where, where we, uh, we connect on Facebook and email and other things like that. But this is actually the first time we have chatted uh, why not it's not really in person but but anyway directly and uh, mm -hmm. and so we're going to be making a kind of a, a thing out of it so we're going to be talking about a lot of interesting things that i think you guys are going to be um very interested in for instance uh so kind of the themes and that will some 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 of the main content that we both produce which is uh why historical accuracy or uh or just historicity, kind of just a nod to historical accuracy, is important in film, even in fantasy and stuff like that. And so that's going to be a really fun discussion. Uh, you guys will probably have questions for us, so we're going to try and fit those in as well. And of course, we're going to be talking about something that is particularly awesome in relation, because you might be wondering, hang on, this is this is about Shadow of the Conqueror. Why is, why is Lloyd here? And if you haven't been up to date on certain, certain announcements... Yeah, where am I here? When are you going to tell me? Yes, exactly. <laughs> we've just we've roped him in, and he has no idea. But act, in actual fact, Lloyd is going to be playing a part in the short film, um, which is going to be very exciting. And there'll be more information on that as well. In fact, there might be might be a bit of a script read where you'll get a small sneak peek, the beginning of one of the scenes that Lloyd and myself will be in. We'll be actually in the film together, which is going to be brilliant and really, really exciting. And so that's what we've got planned for now. And of course, um, whatever comes up along the process as well. But Dylan also has some, uh, just some important things to get through, and then we'll jump right into the meat of, uh, of this video. So thank you, Shad. Um, first thing that we have to go to is the awesome giveaway that we are making, which is the great giveaway of Calamus Souls Witcher 3 Sword uh, that we are giving to uh, one of our $10 tier um, um, backers. Patrons? Patrons? Oh. It's backers, yeah. Backers, yes, you're right. Yeah. Uh, so, someone from our $10 tier backers will win a Calamus Soul Witcher 3 Sword, which is a value of 200 Canadian dollars um, and you also have to share the Calamisil post that is on their Facebook page. If I remember correctly there's a link to their Facebook page in the description. So I own two of them. They're great. Yep so that's uh, one of the things that we had to look at and uh do you want to look at the concept art for Hydon right now, right, well, so we'll, or do you we want to will, wait? Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, no, we'll move into that. Um, but before we do, I think it might like we'll, we'll round up the discussion what we're having currently, which was uh, what was your impression when uh, you, you kind of heard about the project, Lloyd, and also when uh, we offered you saying, "Hey, we'd like you to be part of this." Uh, it's very nice to be invited to stuff. You know, uh, how often does one get asked to be? Uh, in a in a film, and uh, you know how many lifetimes do I get? I, I did a quick count, and it's really not that many. So that you know, why? Not? Yes, I thought. I mean, uh, it was. I put in you know a few caveats, and you know, I, I, I 
exactly the, what I wanted inside my trailer. I mean, obviously, I, I still have standards, but broadly speaking, I just, yeah, go on then. There was a lot of beige for some reason. Beige and a, and a strict denial of anything French, so the baguettes had to be thrown out the window. Well, no, but I wanted the baguettes, but only so that I could throw them out of the window. Oh, oh, dang it. Sorry, we've already done that. Um, See so the things well, can, I have to can, work with, but hey, wait, wait, when you've got talent, you just gotta, you got to do these things. With, with the right budget, you can get pre, uh, pre-defenestrated baguettes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. So uh, we've already talked about how the short film came about, and uh, Dylan uh, and I have talked about that in a previous live stream that's also on the channel. Uh, but one of the things that we always kind of wanted is to make it, I'll try and involve other YouTubers because we'd like to make it not only a nod to uh, the origin of where this is really coming from, um, but uh, to uh, also make it kind of like a community project as well, because uh, Lloyd, as with myself, we have been dying to try and see more historical authenticity in film to make things more believable and realistic and immersive. Um, and uh, this project, that's one of the, the, the main goals for this short film. Um, and so we're just kind of like, ideally, if we ever got to be able to make a larger production, I would love all the YouTubers in our community to be part of it. But because of budget constraints and things, um, we, uh, you know, had to uh, <laughs> had to uh, select one, and uh, and so uh, Lloyd came to, up to the top of the list, and there's a couple <laughs> of other contenders as well. Um, I'm sorry, Lloyd, you weren't the only one. We like we love you, but we also would love to get other YouTubers as well. But we have to balance of who's available, who's willing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, feel confident, fight. They think that would be a part of it, but also there's a lot of uh, scheduling uh, conflicts as well. But anyway, so so. Uh, who reached out to Lloyd first? I can't remember. The, the the first email I recall getting was from you, uh, Shad. Aha. Uh, yeah. And is, but you 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 pointed out in that that you got the Canadian lot and um, and you were already that you were in Australia, uh, and so you you were casting around. I did think that I mean I know that it's a major pandemic, but I did think this was keeping social distancing, you know, taking it a little bit too seriously. I mean. I, uh, but then I imagine this, maybe it's, it was a, sort of a box ticking exercise. You thought, well, we, we, we need more diversity in time zones. We need, you know, we, we've got <laughs> people one side of the planet, the other, something in between. W was that it? Yeah, get a balance. I like uh, when when it comes to social distancing. I think having a content difference helps out in that regard. Uh, mm -hmm. We we hope, of course, the restrictions. Well, we're not hope. We need the restrictions to lift before we can really get into filming, um, uh, which will happen. And so, uh, don't worry. That yeah, and be I should give uh, give everyone a quick update that the uh, Kickstarter has gone really really well. And so, thank you to everyone who's donated. It's been mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. Um, if there's a couple of days left with the Kickstarter. So if any of you guys watching this uh, are in a position to donate, we'll be very grateful because that just means we can make a better film, uh, basically. We can put more into it. I can um, say right now that we are at uh, $102,000 Canadian or 157% with uh, 1,853 backers. So thank you to everyone who has donated to this project that's that's Terrific. amazing so already it's going to be 57 percent better than you'd planned it better be <laughs> if it's not dylan <laughs> uh, it's going to be 150 percent of what we can do awesome awesome so that's actually like really exciting and what's also going to be great about that it's going to be a chance for me and lloyd to meet in person and so we'll be able to make a one or one or two videos uh, in the process and uh, so that'll be heaps of fun mm -hmm. and uh, then we also get to, to, to act, act alongside each other because the the character so you might be wondering who is who on earth is lloyd playing that, that's an interesting question that's hanging in the air um because i've already announced that i'll be playing detective dane and he is in the book and so people who have read the source material might be able to be familiar with that character and so what we're doing actually we're going to be uh, introducing a new character that's going to be detective dane's partner and this works really well because in all honesty i should have included a partner for detective dane anyway um but i was lazy <laughs> so i did it and this is actually an improvement um, because what's what's actually been really fun and encouraging um, when we were talking with uh, Lloyd about you know being in the short film and the character we had in mind, uh, he came back with some uh, feedback and ideas of how a character could 
fit in and what roles he could fill in the scene and everything. And that was actually awesome. And I took him up on some of those some of those ideas. Um, and this character, this new character, is now integrated into that scene in a really natural way, where he's playing off Dane really well. We've got this interesting dynamic. Um, did you have any thoughts or wanted to comment on that, Lloyd, about the character? Um, well, I just show. I mean, the first thing is, that, don't you find it annoying when the film isn't faithful to the book? Well, not necessarily. I, I have I have complex feelings on that. Um, I am very, very annoyed when it's not faithful to the book, uh, when the divergence makes it worse. And usually that is usually nearly almost all the time because usually the book's always better. And so any divergence is, uh, is a detriment. But there are cases when an adaptation happens where they actually change things and it improves it. And I'm all for that, especially because you, when you're dealing with a different medium, you, naturally things have to change anyway uh, and uh, and the nature of uh, you know uh, film screen is, there's a lot of interesting some things can be adapted really well sometimes easily but sometimes things have to be cut and like one of the challenges you work with is is length and so in, in context of this scene because it made it just makes more sense for detective dane to have a partner and it gives him better dynamic for the characters to play off one another um and because i need to actually use um th this character in this next book um mm -hmm. having a, a partner already you know made that fits well with the character helps out so this is in my mind it actually enhances it's an improvement and because of that I'm actually all for it. And it's funny, right? I have a second edition that's technically ready to go through the process to 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 put out and, and publish, um, but I haven't published it yet. And I've been pulling, like, I'm thinking I might want to include um, this new character in that scene um, uh, just because it is an improvement. It's a legitimate improvement. And the character's name is uh, tentatively titled Bright. Detec Detective Bright is uh, Lloyd's character. And, uh, and Bright very well might, because... Sorry, you've asked me a very significant question, Lloyd, and when I'm getting that, I, I go off on a on a on a train, and that you just, I'm, I'm, it's, away. It's, I'm gone. It's a, it's a, yes, it's a more thorough answer than I was expecting. But yeah, hey, you keep going, guy. You keep I, going. I will. I will. Come I'm on, it's a challenge. <laughs> See if you can't fill a whole hour with this. Don't, don't tell me because I really can. <laughs> like that's a subject for a video, just um, adaptation, and when it might be appropriate to change source material or, or to keep it faith, be faithful to it. But well, I'll try I think it if the author enough. himself approved the the modification, but is it really a modification from the source material? Well, it is by definition, but y you can't really say it's unfaithful. But there is that idea of death of the author where they've created something that starts to live on its own. And then even the author can betray the source material. Um, and I actually do yeah. believe in that. that. That is a thing. Um, but uh, going back to uh, what I was saying about um, this character is yeah, because it's an improvement and he fits well. Um, I'm actually thinking that I want to... Uh, ad ad change that in the second edition and include that in the second edition because it's, uh, it's a legitimate improvement um and to be uh, a set part and uh one of the things that works well and why i'm liking it so much and this is one of the approaches that uh lloyd had that i thought was really good is that and by the way i do want to ask you because it seemed like you understood this instinctually because you didn't mention that you know when you're creating a character that's going to be basically in the scene and uh, be a partner to this other character, they need to mesh well together. They need to play off one another. And mm -hmm. in your, uh, when you sent me the email about ideas for this character, it was fully in the context of working off and together and well with the character Dane. Um, mm. And so I'm assuming that you just, ha you understand that, that I narrative idea, it's like the buddy cop thing. Basically when you have two characters that are going to be in a story for most of the time, uh, and this was the very mindset I had with Dalen and Arik. That, like, when I was making their characters, I was specifically constructing them in the mindset: how are they going to interact? And they, it needs to be entertaining, or at least interesting, for the mm -hmm. story to be enjoyable. And uh, and that's the same mindset that you were having with this new character, thinking about Dane. Uh, any thoughts on that, or or was that something? Uh, was you, well, yes. I mean, I I I, I mean, obviously, I, I was honoured that uh, someone would actually create a character for me in order to get me in the in, in the uh, 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 pilot, um, and I saw it as an opportunity, and I just can't help uh, stop myself. I I hope I was decently polite and and not. Um, because I'm aware that some people, this is my creation, and they don't want other people. No, 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 I'm <laughs> writing the thing. Don't you just, you know. Uh, but you, you, were, you were quite receptive to ideas. Um, 
yes, I suppose what I didn't want was to play a character who seemed shoehorned into the scene in order for him to be there and for no other reason. Exactly. Um, because the, actually the scene as it was written was was fine. It was working. Um, so if you put in another character, wh why is he there? Wh why are you dividing mm -hmm. the audience's attention from what, what you were already saying? So he has to add something. Um, and one the thing I suggested was the sort of, uh, I think I called it the Starsky and Hutch approach, where you have another Dane. So you have two Danes who like being Danish and they bounce Danish Danish. Danisms <laughs> off each other, and if you just like Dane, here's more Dane is, is one way of doing it. Um, but also, there's the in order to highlight what Dane is, you have someone else who's not like Dane for contrast, mm -hmm. and that's the one I liked. Um, and the suggestions you had about how he could interact in the scene really worked. And this is uh, this is something that again why I found I enjoyed it so much and why it's improving it because when I wrote that a scene initially, Dane was one of those. Uh, fill the role of the scene type characters. He was basically made off the offset. I need a detective is going to be in that role to, for, just to make the scene put together, which is fine if you're writing a story. There are a lot of characters that just need to fill a role and you quickly, you, you, you do a really quick character model for them. And because of that, Dane didn't ha originally have too much set in stone personality because the scene was shorter. So there was less opportunity for the character, character and mannerisms to come out. And he wasn't that important. But then when I've looked at the second book that I need a detective role and that, <laughs> and I have to admit that when, uh, when it started to be uh, come around that I could play detective Dane, I was like, all right, that meant that caused me to think more deeply about the character. And I started to re have a character come in my mind with that, um, was working and that I could put certain little uh, um, character traits in the scene or accentuate the character traits that I had already given him. And and then when we come to this next evolution of having a new character in, um, there were some lines that um, that was per worked perfectly well for Dane to have, but with the uh, personality we're thinking with Detective Bright, your character Lloyd, it, it made sense to have him say those lines and then accentuate those perks to that, which are the more thoughtful, inquisitive kind of lines. And then there's like, oh, okay, personality. I can divide the lines that conform to this personality and give it to this character, keep the lines that conform to this other personality, keep it with Dane. And now I have an even more distinct character type to work with in that scene. And then then they're also playing off one another. And that's what's kind of happening where Dane is uh, is going to be the more brash, gung-ho type of personality. And his partner, Bright, is the more uh, um, uh, reflective, observant, um, almost bit, bit by the books character. And those are great archetypes that, uh, that play off one another, but they complement one another as well. Um, and again, I've gone off on a long tangent, but that's what happens <laughs> when you ask me a question. Uh I have a few questions from the public. Uh, let's me, Oh, absolutely. Uh, oh. So, Shad, are you nervous about playing Detective Dane? So, I'm actually more excited. And, uh, and one of the things that, if I ever do feel nervousness start to rise, I need to pause and say, hang on, Shad. You've technically already been seen by a couple of million people. You don't need to be too nervous about. Um, and then it's just this exciting, because this is the other thing, right? Secretly, I in my youth, I wanted to be an actor. That was one of the lifelong goals. Um, and then I realized I enjoyed making the stories more than uh, being, uh, I guess, bound to them and, and some other things. And actually, you know the reason why I wanted to be an actor is because they got to use swords. I would watch um, Kevin Costner on Prince of Thieves and it's like, look at all the swords he's getting to use with it. Use. If I get to be an actor, I could use swords because <laughs> I had no idea how to get them otherwise. Um, but then I call it like uh, things of old and stuff. But I had always uh, taken the opportunity to do some acting like in school plays and other things like that. And uh, even with YouTube being myself, there is an element of acting involved where you purposely kind of, I'm not sure if you do this, Lloyd, but there are certain elements of your own personality that you, you try and enhance um, for, uh, you know, uh, effect uh, for the, you know, whatever you're doing. And I know you've done certain little playful skits in your own videos sometimes. Do you uh, certain like trigger certain parts of your personality to oh, be right, more yes. accentuated? Um, uh, I, um, I seem to find it easy to talk to a camera. Um, mm. Most I find it odd that most people who talk completely normally, as soon as they start acting, 
lose the ability to speak. Yeah. So it's a- they, 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 they say, just ask him what time is it? And rather than say, what time is it? They say, what time is it? They just, <laughs> no, 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 just say it normally. What time is it? And no, just say it normally, but without the stress. And just, they, most people just suddenly become incredibly unnatural. Um, but I find that I can look at a camera and just imagine that there's a person there and I talk to that person. Um, yeah. So I suppose that's part of how I approach acting and think, well, what, what would he be thinking at this point? I'll, mm-hmm. I'll think those thoughts and it'll affect the way that I end up saying the line. Um, and what I don't like to see is what Keanu Reeves did in Speed. I don't know if you've seen Speed, have you? It's been a while. Been okay, a while. well, here was this you know, young, good-looking actor, a rising star, and I could see him all the way through the film doing what some actors do, which was he wasn't playing the part to the actor who was next to him. He was playing the part to all the girls in the audience in the cinema. Uh, he, what he was saying was, hey, girls, I really am this cool. Uh, he was he was trying yeah. to be cool for the benefit of the audience, not the character for the benefit of the actor he was talking to. Um, and when I see that, it always grates on me. They like, don't try to be cool. Don't don't try <laughs> to look attractive. So if you're if you're in a sword fight, um, and your character is desperate and he might be killed, don't sword fight as though ah oh, of course I won't be killed because I'm the hero and I know it's in the script that I win. You know, because then you lose the des- the desperation of, ah, I'm in a sword fight, and this guy's got a sharp thing, and I might die any second now. Um, just just play the part, and if you don't look cool, uh, that's fine. <laughs> you know? And I think that would be a good segue to uh, get uh, Dawson in here to see how he's yeah. going to play uh, Dalen. Okay, but are we just going to walk by that absolutely amazing uh, impression that Lloyd did of... Uh, of- Um, uh, what's his name? Speed. I can't believe. Uh, don't, don't, don't. Keanu Reeves. No, I just, Keanu, Keanu. That was a brilliant impression, by the way. Um, oh, I don't know. Just <laughs> came out of the blue. Just, like... just completely off the cuff. <laughs> But you do have some acting experience, don't you? Oh, yeah. I was in the school play every year. Yeah. <laughs> so, like. Anyway, we, we can't we can't let the people hanging, leaving oh, all the true, people hanging. True. You can't introduce the star and then <laughs> not bring him on, ladies okay. and gentlemen. So, well, let's start with his clip, the the clip of his audition that everyone uh, raves about, because some of your audience, Lloyd, might not have seen it. Uh, and have you? I, seen I suppose it? that's possible. Have you seen the Sorry? clip of Dawson? I, I've seen the audition. Yeah, fantastic okay. eyebrow work. Okay, so. Let's put this yeah. on. And, uh, <laughs> well, that's actually true. Like in terms of uh, holding a solid, you know, stern gaze, which is the, the character needs that. Mm-hmm. Dawson actually pulls that off brilliantly. He's got the kind of steel look. So she's like, mm. so uh, come on, bring him on. <laughs> we want this. We want the star. We want the star. The come on. Guilds force you to work like slaves, but you could quit at any time and demand better conditions under the law. Dalis truly enslaved all of his people, and any who dared not do the work he ordered were executed. This is outrageous. Your father would be so... I am the conqueror! And I tried to kill myself, but instead of the sweet release of death, I was cursed with youth. You want to know what the conqueror thinks of you and your pathetic little cult? Well, here he is! And here he is, Dawson Elkey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know you definitely reminded me of the of the new version of spock in in the in the new versions you know with with simon pegg as, as scotty oh yes oh um can't remember the actor's name no, but... yeah, um, quentin quentin not tarantino um <laughs> definitely not <laughs> it's something clinton do i have time to to google that no we have people we have don't. people for that Yes, yeah, it's we, gonna be okay, spammed yeah. in chat. Like already, I would know the chat will be spamming the character's name. Um, so um, yeah, uh, that's true. The question we were having is, what are you gonna be thinking during the sword fights? <laughs> what I'm, 
<laughs> what am I going to be thinking during the sword fights is, uh, holy crap, holy crap, uh, does this look good? Do I look like I know what I'm doing? And this is a dream come true. The reason I'm an actor is because I want to be in a sword fight, but now... <laughs> okay, this is just... I, I'm sorry. You all... <laughs> you're talking about, like, what an actor should do and comfort in front of the camera and all of this stuff, and I'm sitting here about to go on with you guys, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I, um uh lloyd can you be my yes. acting coach on set through the whole process i i could i could try to fake being an acting coach is, is that what you want someone acting what? the part of being an acting coach i no, mean as long as i'm convincing it'll be reassuring right what you said was absolutely perfect uh what you said was perfect and it's everything i've ever thought about acting i mean my whole life is i you know was i i'm a theater man as well from school and everything like that and yeah i mean get, get, people talk normally and then they get on stage and suddenly they're you know that that sort of thing um and okay, yeah and that's just the way they stand <laughs> uh, yeah I, I don't i don't know if it's like a like a Lawrence olivier thing I, I mean he was good but sometimes also weird um hang on okay so the eyebrow issue that or uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the name you were looking for, I think it was Zachary Quinto. Maybe Zachary, Zachary. Quinto is that? Okay. Um, so you mentioned the eyebrows, and you said nice eyebrow work, and immediately I, I, I registered. I'm very sorry. jealous of your eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, I was okay, looking well, at you. Dawson with his phone, like <laughs> see, looking at himself, like how he was moving his eyebrows. It was very funny. Um, so well one of the only com one of the only comments i saw r miraculously that was somewhat negative or critical about my performance in that audition uh and i think there's plenty to critique there but one of the only ones i saw was you didn't move your eyebrows enough and so now i'm well that person was clearly an ignoramus i mean know. they don't if they can't <laughs> recognize good brow work when they see it uh, you just you just well, don't listen I'm to these people I'm so thankful that you do. And you know where I learned that? I, well, for one thing, from watching my amateur film work, I was like, there's something my face is doing that isn't right, that other actors don't do. And then I started paying attention while I was watching Game of Thrones. Go back, watch Game of Thrones. They never move an eyebrow, not once, unless there's a, unless very specifically at, uh, or if it's like a character thing, like Braun probably moves his eyebrows because he's like, I'm a drunken, you know, mercenary, but like everyone else. And, and it's because why well, I'm not going to go into why, but you know, because we have a more important things to do, but thank you. Uh, yes. I, I study. I, I have a relax. question from Rebecca Violet. Um, so Shad, can Dalen have a son named Dawson in the book too? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's considering it. <laughs> oh, no, he's not considering it. He's frozen. Can you hear me now? Am I back? Yes, you're uh, You're back. And when you right. froze, you had a really good look on your face. So it worked, <laughs> oh. it worked beautifully. Uh, that's thumbnail material. Yeah. Mm. Eyebrow work. Yeah, exactly. You see, you see his eyebrow. Oh, you see, you see how much you overdid it there. I know <laughs> that's that's going to be my focus. Actually, is uh, my my thing when I look at um, act, acting that comes across as genuine versus amateurish. Is amateurish always seems overacted, where they they re they're trying too hard. Um, and even because we have Dawson here for a reason, we we decided we're going to try and do a, a small reading of the script um, uh, all together because. Funnily enough, uh, it starts off with our three characters in the scene. And uh, and I hope people will not take my performance here as with the uh, level of effort I will put in when we're actually filming. Okay, so don't judge me is basically what I'm saying. And I um, think Lloyd uh, read his line twice now. So. I, 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 hang on, I've read the script once <laughs> and I've been shown it from a distance once. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I still don't know, am I going to do it with uh, with my um, Alec Guinness voice or not? Well, see, this is actually, is, this yes. is why I wanted to say for the, because I think this would be a lot of fun just discussing it and letting people see, is because we haven't decided the delivery of Detective Bright. Um, and so uh, we can kind of hear different 
different uh, versions from Lloyd and then we can decide which one we like, which one we think, okay, that's working and uh, what we can go with. And it, Lloyd can suggest, you know, ones that he feels more comfortable with as well. And so, All right. But, um, so we, it's a Canadian, French Canadian, Australian uh, <laughs> with, with a Brit in it. So do you have a fantasy world in which people speak a version of English? Um, yes. And uh, have you got some reason why there, there's this diversity of accents or, or well, are we all going to try to... Oh. There, there is an actual a very good in-world explanation about that. Um, in the past, during, a con the, during the reign of the tyrant Daedalus the Conqueror, one thing that he was not was an isolationist. He actually opened borders and forced people to migrate a lot. And this is a specific thing that's mentioned in the book because it facilitates certain events that happened later on in his rule, which ultimately culminated in his downfall. But as a result, Hamara it has a, a much greater diversity of culture and accents and other things like that, which actually gives us a bit of freedom in terms of the accents that might come out in the characters. Now, the, the Hamara-based culture is more American-British accent-based. Um, and there are other countries that um, just because they're kind of visually flavored after like uh, the country, uh, the De, De La Vie, um or the Delavian, you know, Dukes and stuff they mentioned because they're more based. You'll love this. Or they're based off of the French. Um, I'm tempted to give them a, a you, French every, accent. Every book's got to have villains. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, well, um, at so least uh, I can pl I could play a Delavian Duke. Do you want to play one of the Dukes? Because you know the reputation they have. <laughs> um, but so your your actual natural accent could work fit Detective Bright perfectly fine, and and so it really uh, will depend on what you feel comfortable with, but also what sounds genuine. Because when I was brainstorming the accent I wanted to give to Detective Dane. Um, I did try giving myself a British accent um, and I end up going way too far. Every time I was speaking, I was going way too far. I'll take more training for me to rein it back and make it something more manageable. But I didn't want to give myself my regular voice. It's too, I don't know, Aussie or Ocker. Uh, um, and it di I didn't feel it suited, but I didn't want it to sound unnatural. And so, all right, um, there is a country that would have a slight Aussie kind of accent in the book, and that is Maine. There is an island nation of Maine. We have a much more accentuated so, Pommy slash Aussie accent, so that could work, and Dane could have some background there. But then I just would make it more gruff, and it, and it kind of evolved into me talking a bit like this, and this is going to be Detective Dane's voice, and it suits the character. It works a bit, and that's kind of what uh, I, I was pretty happy with, and and Dylan was happy with, and this is this is now Dane's voice. That was my thought process, and mm. I'm more than happy. And I think we all like same with Dylan and uh, and Francis to let you ha go through that same process with Bright there, Lloyd. What you feel comfortable and what works. Right. Uh, I mean, one one possibility is just my 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 own voice. Another one is an exaggerated version of it, um, which s with some people. Uh, they, they report that it lurches towards Graham Chapman, John Cleese, Eric Idle. Um, could could we uh, have a sample oh, of that? I want to hear that now. Well, I suppose it's it's largely where you 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 shoot up into falsetto a lot. You know, so if someone's just smashed his thumb, for instance, you might go, "What are you talking? He just smashed his thumb." <laughs> <laughs> and it, but actually, you know, if, if someone is not trying to be cool and they're in an interrogation room, there's no audience there and someone has just smashed his thumb, you might just leap into falsetto. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, so maybe it's, it's actually not necessarily ridiculous, but if it reminds people too much of the Python, the Pythons leapt into falsetto a lot. That was one of the things they did. Um, that, that people might be too reminded of that and maybe that's not the way to go. Well, it's funny. These are my thoughts in just your example there. And this is part of the fun brainstorming back and forth process of deciding how a character, you know, can be betrayed and stuff is that because I picture Bright generally more reserved in his kind of resting personality, it would have a almost a fun comedic contrast that he can suddenly break out of that when he's flustered or something like that and then jump into mm -hmm. that whole set of thing. And that could work really well mm -hmm. for the character, kind of like um, – if you could imagine Spock, um, who's always serious, and though that's too far, I would say Spock is too far for in terms of 
the reserved nature that Bright would have. But if you could imagine that type of character suddenly getting flustered and breaking out and uh, he has kind of limits of that that reserve and then he mm -hmm. that could work that would have a good contrast kind of that could come off even you could get a few gags played well that way when he breaks out of his you know his natural reserve into mm -hmm. oh, what <laughs> mm. i'm Just not sure thought. that i could find it very easy to go from a sort of alec guinness calm and collected way of talking into the falsetto but we can always try it. We could try it. We could brainstorm. Um, personally, I, I think your that. natural voice um, suits a bit better than the Alec Guinness one that you did then. But this, um, was, this was amazing, though. Uh, <laughs> really, I, I wasn't looking at the screen. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> But hey, that's the other thing. If Dylan and Francis like it, they're the ones out of the calls. They're making the film. So I, I'm not sure it's going to fit the character. Any, in any case, it's Francis that decides he's the director, not me. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Aha, yes. I but want to do a British accent too. Oh, really? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that. I love because you you're like, I, do. I guess I'm, I'm in love with your audition, and so now that's daily in my head. And uh, like, it might be hard for me to get pulled out of that mindset, but if you can, if you can do it and you can convince Francis, no, I well, so I just love all variants of the British accent, it's my favorite. I actually think a lot in a British accent, um, and uh, I read a lot in a, in a British accent too, and there's a lot of um. A lot of Dalen's lines, he he comes off so much like an Imperial officer from Star Wars. Um, just a, a cold, steel, deep, I suppose, Benedict Cumberbatch, perhaps, or, you know, anything Tom Hardy does is brilliant. But um, anyhow, um, I, I, I figured it, you probably weren't going to go British. But if that was ever on the table, I mean, I'd love to. If you uh, want to try, try you, you can. Well, this is the time to experiment. Um, okay, so did you want to? Yeah, when we have fun. Yeah, do, do yeah. Guys wanna the, the right, let, okay. you guys want to try the the few lines that we had? All right, let's do um, that. So I, I will kick us off. Um, just give me a visual cue because now, of course, I can't see the live stream. So tell me when you guys are ready, and I can I can kick us off. I'll try and uh, you know <laughs> get in. Red, get in the, uh, red, the red five stand by. <laughs> so you're all ready. <clears throat> Shad, go ahead. Action. <clears throat> okay. You made the front page. Killing Blackheart will do that. Yeah. And I'm sure you being the son of the great bastard has nothing to do with it. It's a nice redemption story, isn't it? Yeah, but you're not responsible for your father's actions. He casts a long shadow. I've been wondering... Is he really dead? I mean, he should have been for 20 years already, but the bastard has a knack for surviving the impossible. I was there. Dalus threw himself from the continent. The Conqueror is gone. And now you are trying to make amends for your father's actions? Bring some light to the shadow falling on you? Something like that. Very good, guys. <laughs> oh! <laughs> that's 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 done. That's, that's, that's like ready for film. Let's go. <laughs> People wanted to have a sneak peek of the film. I think uh, they've got something right there. That uh, I, I was, that gave I, me a bit. And of I couldn't context. see any of you. For the record, I couldn't see any of you. All I'm staring at is a black screen. So I, <laughs> I hope Same. that worked. And wow, you're, you're, you're off the books already. <laughs> <laughs> you got, I'm not sure if people noticed, you, I broke character when Lloyd was speaking because I was enjoying the delivery. And I was like, that's <laughs> yeah, it. I, I had a bit of difficulty following with the cameras, but uh, hey. Uh, uh, oh, wow. So that actually gave me a bit of a buzz. That's actually great. Um, oh, I love giving people a buzz. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I'm so, gonna I'm gonna have to thank you, Dawson, for being here uh, and let you go because we're we also have Francis that's gonna come in. So I, I don't want to go. I don't want to <laughs> go, Mister Stark. Uh, 
<laughs> well, just, oh, uh, does he have to? Do, do leave like the a eyebrow. band-aid. You just got to rip it off quickly, like a band-aid. Just go. <laughs> just go. <laughs> so thanks a lot, thanks, Dawson, Dawson, for being here. All right, gentlemen, it has been an absolute honor. Um, I love you guys. Thank you. Uh, talk to you soon. See you in the C1 set. You guys are great actors. Ooh. Well, we're go you're going to have rehearsals with both of them. Yes. Uh, also. I would like to think I could be passable. I'm, I'm not. Well, hopefully we can achieve great. We will see how we go. <laughs> oh, you are great. It's in you. And, it, and it's not about, it's just about, it's about being yourself. And... <laughs> Being the See, I still think I um, over deliver the line sometimes. That, I'm hypercritical, but anyway. Um. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I and I'm open and I, criticism. That's who you, you and Lindy Bay's, your critics. And so, you know, being here at all was really vulnerable for me. But thank you guys for just um, giving me a chance. Uh, you, you, so, uh, oh, he's right. got this Oscar speech thing down, hasn't he? I mean, he really <laughs> does. It's, it's, yeah, he's they, already ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I spent all my time in the shower dreaming up my Oscar speech. So, uh, that's... well, clearly, well, I, I have to admit, I have thought about an Oscar speech myself. You know, I, like, who doesn't? It's like if you ever get there, what would you say? Have. Well, I haven't. Well in, I mean, well, in my case, it was a BAFTA, but yeah. You know. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, in a BAFTA with your tea, dreaming up your Oscar speech. Um, no, should, a BAFTA, uh, not a BAFTA. Over? There's not just things like BAFTA. <laughs> <laughs> a, a bathtub. A bath. What it? It's not. It's, you're right. Is that is that is that insight to the uh, Dalen's British accent there, Dawson? I just assumed you were going to play him Scouse. A scouse. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I just. I calm just thought, down. Bath, calm down. It's, I'm the bastard, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's Livia Saw. Li Livia Bath. I don't know. I thought I knew how accents worked, and then I. Probably. No. Okay. <laughs> I'll go now yeah. before. <laughs> no, I it's been, it's been great, Dawson. Okay, so thanks, right. it's been great, thanks Dawson. See bye you bye. next time. Thanks, everyone. See you. Cheers. Oh, no, I feel guilty now. <laughs> feels, like, feels like something's missing. <laughs> Honestly, though, that, that script read was... That, I love that. That was actually... <laughs> It is making me excited for the scene, honestly, because um, like I was saying before, they're, they're, mm -hmm. there's the division of personality has made these characters more distinct and uh, it was just coming through. So I was really appreciating that. But is Francis uh, available in there? In yeah, Dylan? he's here. So uh, Francis uh, is here with us. Holy crap. Hi, everyone. Hello, Francis. And your new haircut. <laughs> yes, my new haircut. Yeah, I have an haircut game, like an air game. He has the eyebrows. I have the air game. So yeah, everyone has something. And you have the beard. So good. Uh, hang on, hang on. Us, we all have beards. I, I, we're all kind of getting there. I think. Well, so. you've you've got a beard, Chad, I suppose. <laughs> yes, I, I'm new to the beard game. I bow to the, I bow to the authority. I, I think part. Lloyd uh, has some. Uh, uh, experience uh, behind him. <laughs> no, I did comment on Francis's haircut there. It looks like the fake Viking one um, uh, that you see everywhere <laughs> whenever Vikings are depicted now. Um, but thank you, oh, Francis. It's great to have you. And uh, so with the director uh, joining us, there is some interesting questions. And uh, Lloyd, did you have a question that you wanted to ask Francis there? Or did Francis, you have a question for Lloyd? Whether, whether can mention it first. Oh, well, I do um, have a question, but I do okay. have a remark. Uh, since I've been watching the live, obviously, before jumping in. Uh, great job. It actually sounds oh. good. And uh, the scene actually felt really good. So Don't I sound too to... surprised. It's like I was expecting a disaster, but it actually sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> so my director's uh, notes are, I yeah, do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to do some rehearsals if we actually get to it at some point because it will be hard with the different time zones to mm. get everyone together <laughs> well, well we'll figure something out <laughs> we'll get there i i have another question from the public uh Good. oh yeah uh so it's uh just let me find it again um <laughs> okay so i i had it it was uh shad what do you think about lorraine's uh interrogation room uh, uh 
design. Concepts. Concept designs, design. yeah. Concept, yeah. And I'm going to oh, show them for those who didn't see it yet. Oh, you mentioned that we're going to look at High Door and then we got oh, all the tangents. <laughs> so how about we do that now? We'll look at some of the designs Aha. and concepts. Um, I, I think that's got a bit of the Art Deco in it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing although, that I liked as well. Sorry, mm. go well, it's also a little bit like an Arc Deco gents, though, with the, the tiles on the wall. Uh, yes. <laughs> needs to be I, urinal. It doesn't, it doesn't fit without one. <laughs> but I, I like it in that it's not the usual uh, dank, candlelit, dungeony interrogation cell, grim, gr grim, dark, grim, dark, grim, dark. They've, they've gone the other way. And yet it's still got a sort of grimness in its, in its plain white windowlessness. It's sterile, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, for on my end, uh, I love that you, you latched on to the architectural norms because generally whenever fantasy comes up, and this is no dig against the, the trends because I love medieval fantasy, <laughs> but it has kind of surprised some people that the book is technically not medieval fantasy and the, the, uh, the aesthetic, the, the fashion and the architecture and everything like that is far more reminiscent of a later period. And you guys, uh, you've, you've latched onto that and you've really made it shine. Like even in like small little touches, like the Roman columns in the, in the corners of the room. Um, and then of course you have the, the frame around the door with the same type of, you know, header on there. And then you have the chairs and it, it really captures that kind of, style that exists in the world and it makes it it, it feels like that is everfall and so that was my impressions i, I loved it do you have right. feedback as well francis that you want to say on uh, lorraine's uh, interrogation room no actually uh, i'm thinking pretty, i'm thinking pretty much the same as shad it, it looks really amazing and actually i was a bit worried because i didn't want him to say something negative about it and then we would have like it would have been weird but <laughs> but now it's a, it's a actually a really great room and I, i'm happy you like it it's uh they've worked uh, very hard on that one it's, and it's, what's in oh. oh no no you go Lloyd. well i was gonna say one, one way in which it breaks the cliche is that you almost always have uh, darkness for a background and strong down is usually just like a spotlight, isn't there? Sort of down on mm -hmm. someone with heavy shadows. But here we've got the, the lights quite low on the wall all around and the walls are white. So you've got a, a, a soft light all around 360. So it's going to give a, a, a good, a very different sort of cliche breaking look to it. Yeah. And in regards to the like how, uh, you'll be able to use and run that with filming and everything like that. I, I have no experience with the camera work. I, you know, I, I, will, I defer to you. Um, but I'll be exciting to see how that actually looks on, on camera um, when, uh, when the, after the filming is done. Oh. All right. So I believe you had another, another concept piece uh, to show us there, Dylan. Do you want to see Haidon? Yes. Is this the one that you... I, oh, I have not seen this one. <laughs> oh, that's that's brilliant. Okay, what is that? <laughs> what is that uh, bridge made out of? <laughs> um, a, a strong type of stone, probably granite. If I was to uh, strong. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there is an advantage in this world. Um, there is a material called dark stone that, when it's trapped from light, it is physically locked in space. And they use that in architecture to help stabilize things to either, not only just to build much higher than would be feasibly logical, but to have to have things floating in the air, like a building just sitting on these dark stones. So you have, it, you have a stone of this dark stone, you've, you've quarried it in the darkness by feel, then you wrap it in a sheet and you take it up to that place and then you expose it to light and it doesn't move from then on. Well, no, no, it's only when it's when it's um, uh, locked off from light, it, it doesn't move. And so when light is shining on it, that's when it can move. Well, clearly you, with, with that invention, you have set the artist's uh, uh, imagination free there because he's... <laughs> and you have but, oh, a, a small great. glimpse of uh, the new concept that we have for the Lumatorium at the top. I... Yeah, I have not seen that one yet. So I'll be very interested in seeing the final... Um, uh, final concept piece for that um i don't i, I think it's closer to what uh, you had in mind but uh 
Mm-hmm. We'll have to but see. But seriously, like High Dawn looks brilliant. Um, now, if people are wondering about the shadow, the discs are casting on the ground. We're basically just like going to say that or add that there's these massive sunstone beacons on the underside, which basically sheds light to um, remove some of the shadow. Um, but man, that is looking absolutely spectacular. I, uh, Gosh. Torbjorn, our concept artist, uh, made that during one night and I woke up to that image and I was blown <laughs> away. Uh, Gosh. That's, that's a, like, sorry, because this is one of those, you know, pinch me moments when you've uh, written a work and then you see kind of people taking that and then depicting it, I and this one visually, and when it fits it so perfectly, you get to see it, you know, see your, you know, your world like that. It's a, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. It's just like, oh, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Gosh. So yeah, <laughs> uh, but hey, what were your what, any thoughts on that, Lloyd? Um, if you if you don't have any, you don't have to share. But uh, I, I don't. Um, well, I, uh, so the where the horizon is looks a little strange, but that's because the world actually is flat and it comes to an edge. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Well, exactly. so it because that looks right in that it doesn't look like Earth because the horizon is wrong. If you know <laughs> yes. what I mean. So he's captured that, and there are big lumpy things near the horizon. I thought maybe they were gargantuan trees, but I think they're floating rocks, are they? Yes, floating islands. Oh, Correct. right. So it's like it's like uh, the, uh, the the cover of a Yes album, if that means <laughs> anything to you. Unfortunately, no. I have no idea <laughs> Which, what that Well, it's essentially, if you've seen Avatar, you've seen the, the covers of ah, most yes. of the Yes albums. You can Google for it later. Ah, okay. Uh, Roger, Roger Dean, I think, was the, the artist that they've shamelessly ripped off in Avatar. Oh, well, there you go. Because it's interesting, floating land masses like rocks and islands and stuff is a bit mm. of a trope in fantasy, but it's one that I've always loved, yet I've always had a pet peeve because all the explanations that I've ever heard about these floating things were absolutely stupid. Like the one in Avatar, oh, it's something with, uh, you know, mag- electromagnetic something, something. Right? And, uh, it's like, no, it's not going to cause these things. So, oh. And if it if it had enough force to hold up mass like that, there is no way in hell you're going to be flying through it. You'll be crushed onto the side of whatever force is pushing you in that direction and stuff. And so um, when I made Everfall, I liked it, but I wanted to explain it logically how these things are. And the, the answer is they have dark stone embedded in their, in their core, which is locked off from light. And then they're physically locked in space. And that's why they're suspended there. Um, All right. Well, the new dramatic cup that was about a mile long, the statue of Arthur Dent, if you remember that that was held there by art, because uh, as, as the bird explained, uh, the law of gravity is not as indiscriminate as you, in, indiscriminate as you think. <laughs> that was Douglas Adams' uh, way of getting around the same problem. It's, it's a great concept thing. So what, what happens with that then? Does, does that get sent to an mm. animator to bring to life? Yes, uh, we have uh, Paul, our 3D artist, who is currently working on modeling uh, the the buildings in the city of Haidon uh, for uh, shots in the in the short film. Now, I, see, when you're making a pilot, if you're trying to sell the idea to a big stu- to 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 some financiers who are going to put money into the the full budget version, um, sometimes I think you don't need to try the special effects you could just say you know special effects shot here of big city or whatever because they're studio executives they should have the imagination to to understand that once the special effects people have have done their bit it'll look good but that doesn't seem to be the way people make pilots they actually go to a lot of effort to make that sort of thing look as good as they can even though they can't take it all the way to the full feature well standard the the most important thing in my opinion is to make sure that uh, it's to uh, show to people what the audience's reaction is. So you, it, we have to show mm-hmm. the uh, the short film to the audience and see their reaction, see uh, how much they want to have the full version of this in order to show it to investors. And I'm going to say investors more than studios because we discussed it with Shad and selling it to Netflix is not our idea at all mm-hmm. because um, we respect what Shad has created and we don't want anyone to come in 
first of all, throw us out, then take Shad's book and do whatever they want with it. And just murder it. Like, uh, I, mm. I'm, just on that note, do you have any, are there any adaptations of novels that you've read that the scene come to film that you particularly loathe in terms of how poorly they adapted the source material? Is there anyone that comes to your mind, Lloyd? Oh, to mine. Um, yeah. uh, oh, Drat. Unfortunately, the thing which leapt to mind was the opposite, which is one a rare instance of a film that <laughs> was actually better than the book. Um, uh, well, yes, the, when, if you're going to make a change to something that a lot of people love, like in, when I watched The Fellowship of the Ring, um, there are a couple of little changes in it, which are just, just no! <laughs> <laughs> why do you do that um why did they make um uh um, frodo come up with the solution of how to get into moria anyone who's read the book mm-hmm. knows it's, it's gandalf and <laughs> it, i i thought that was such a dramatic mistake as well because the, the next big thing that happens in the fellowship of the ring is they lose gandalf so the scene where everyone's just sitting around doing nothing <laughs> waiting for the wizard to work it out showed you how utterly dependent they were on Gandalf. So it's actually it a th- very good point. Very good point. I hadn't, I, that one's never been framed to me in that way. But now that you pointed out, yeah, you're absolutely right. So if you think, oh, don't worry, he was a doddery old idiot anyway, the, the Hobbit will think of it. Oh, we don't need him. Oh, he's fallen down a big a hole in the ground. Oh, never mind. I just, <laughs> no, don't make this change. And, <laughs> and plus, I remember that scene from the book and I loved that scene from the book. So... So don't don't change it unless you're going to make it one hell of a lot better. Is is my, my feeling with these these beloved books? I suppose you mm. sort of have a bit of luxury here, Shad, because um, begging your pardon here, uh, you you haven't perhaps uh, um, had sales that rival Tolkien. So, <laughs> so your, your 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 work is a bit more plastic in the minds of the general public. That is true, and <clears throat> and is working with these guys as well who have been. They're like, they've let me be the biggest pain in the neck and just say, ah, oh, I really don't like that. Could you change it? And they have they've bent over backwards, basically, to accommodate, which is like, blown, really impressed me. And uh, and so that's made me uh, really encouraged for where the short film is going. But anyway, we, we, we brought on the director and then we haven't that's been talking true. to him. <laughs> so. I love hearing you talk, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, well, yes, but all the ladies and gentlemen want to want to know about uh, your 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 fears and ambitions for this piece as a director. Yeah, what's your thoughts on uh, on <clears throat> certain things, but also uh, um, uh, the scene that Lloyd is going to be a part of, and uh, and and uh, just yeah, any anything, any questions that you might have? It's, it's your opportunity, sir. Well, as of right now, for that scene, though, like if we talk about fears and ambitions. Uh, the thing I fear most is screwing up the fight scene. Um, because this is something that is so well described in the book and something that you've been acclaimed for uh, by fans. It, yeah, the, the fight scenes. And it is been it is something that is important to me since day one that we need to nail that scene. I'm pretty confident we can do it since we have a really good team <laughs> uh, behind the... Uh, behind us uh but this is my fear screwing that part up uh apart from that well i really want to show people the universe so uh if i can do that then that people dream about it afterwards and feel like it is a real place and not just a made-up place that we show them on screen uh well yeah i think that that's my ambition i just want to make them dream that's all i want and do you uh, do you have some oh no, no, you go, Lloyd. Go. Well, do you have some general policies about what, the way you think things ought to be directed? Because you might, you might see films and go. When I go to anything, a play, <laughs> a, a film, or whatever, I, I, unfortunately, I almost never can stop myself thinking, "No, oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. I'd have done it this way." You know, the actor. Oh, I'd have said the line this way, and and I suppose that's partly a sign if I'm not enjoying something. If I'm absolutely in it, I'm not thinking that. But a lot of the time, if I think mm, I'd have done it differently, and, and do you have this? Oh, I wish they wouldn't do that in films. Feeling about stuff. Yes, I do all the time, and my girlfriend hates it uh, because I break the magic to her. <laughs> but uh, uh, I try not to do that in front of her. But uh, yeah, I do. Um, and uh, usually, it's more uh, on a um, 
how can I say that? Uh, the way they show, like, usually as a director, yes, you direct the actors and you choose, well, you direct the actors mainly, this is your job, you want them to be as good as possible for the movie. But you have a lot of other things that you can think about to tell the story, which is the camera angle, the shot you want to take. Why do you want to take that shot? Uh, why is that character dressed like this? Or why is that poster on the wall behind that character at that moment when he says it? It's all the type of things that sometimes you do see in movies. And when you do, it's really amazing because you can have an insight on really what's coming in the future in the movie before before everything happens like just today i watched uh, i was watching saw five which i never thought i would see something like this but there is a point where you see the uh, the the police of the, the policeman uh, trapped in front of jigsaw and he start talking to him and trying to lure him inside that uh well that thing he does <laughs> if we can say that and there's one shot just one he, he actually dragged a mirror in front of him and you see that little puppet over the shoulder of the policeman. And from that point on, when he chooses, he won't bring Jigsaw to the police. Jigs Jigsaw is actually training him after that. So it's like him watching over that guy. And I just thought, holy crap, I never thought I would see that in that movie. Like, this is one thing I really like. And then my girlfriend mm -hmm. just said, oh, can you stop that? Blah, blah, blah. But... Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's important to me that we can show as much as possible of the story with everything we have and not just, well, the the, the acting and uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, everything is important to me. So when I see something that is not, well, that they could have done and they don't do it, it, it actually pisses mm -hmm. me off. <laughs> so where, where, where do you stand on the uh, between on the spectrum of one end uh cut every half a second, shake the camera around like crazy and hold it very close and move it all, all over the place while people are fighting, uh, or lock the camera off, sit it in a big wide angle and just let the people perform in front of the camera and just make it one grand long shot, which is the opposite extreme. Okay. Uh, I hate chaos cinema, which is the first one you described. I just right. hate it. Uh, it is something that when you cut off the sound, nothing makes sense like you can look at it and nothing made sense um mm -hmm. in the other hand though when you place a camera in one place and you have really a, a, a well-built um storyboard of the fight scene it all come together perfectly and it is like way more enjoyable to watch and you can really tell a story with that with the other one you cannot tell a story like in some occasion it will fit but um, even up to this day, I didn't find a movie where I was just like, oh, nice use of it. Like, I just really hate it, like, very mm. much. So I'm more, I prefer, like, having a very detailed shot list of that fight scene, knowing where we're going and making everything works from point A to point B, than having a camera very up close and giving everyone the feeling that they're going to puke. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, and it, it's great that you have this creative control. Fred Astaire uh, used to have this problem as well. He was like sort of the Jackie Chan of dancing, and that he wanted he wanted the director to just stay wide. You know, I've spent many days rehearsing this dance. I dance from my my head to my toe. I know how to move. Let me just show the camera what I can do. You know, I, I this is what I do on a stage. Let me do it in front of a, a camera. It's, it's I think it's similar with really good fighters if they're really good oh yes i agree sh show them being really good stay wide exactly Oops. sorry and i shouldn't say that and sorry then i shouldn't say that to a director oh. <laughs> <laughs> and when you go close up it, it's just way more meaningful like it's just not like oh you're close and you're like you're not wasting it like it, it gives more mm. uh, adrenaline to the to the fight scene and it actually brings more emotion to the people watching it than having a close up all the way from the beginning to the end with shaky camera. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have wanna see. we're, we're going to have <laughs> awesome sets to show as well. And you don't want to uh, yeah. go super close up where you don't never see the set. Uh, no, and, exactly. Uh, I almost I'm ashamed at admitting I've watched these films they were so bad. Um but if you guys want uh, like the best example of the worst type of uh, camera work for a fight scene <laughs> 
to on account for the fact that the actors can't fight at all and they're trying to hide that with these they close up on the thing and they, they do a thing close up there and they and they and they're never doing a wide shot showing the do it's charlie's angels and oh it was painful <laughs> um and this is a guy that loves jackie chan you know fight scenes and stuff and he does everything like why you know further out shot where you can see everything and it's amazing because it's really him doing it um and that was the, the the standard i i had and enjoyed and then going to this garbage it was just mm. oh, oh my goodness um so we might move to some questions in the chat and then thank francis for coming on and move on in uh, the structure of this uh, this video so uh, are there any questions that we might quickly ask? answer there well let's just say goodbye well, to francis before well yeah. actually oh. i have a question for shad uh which is a, a question that came from uh from uh, one of our fan which is named aj it came on the uh, on the later uh, well actually an earlier uh, uh live stream uh, he asked if a light bringer makes food of light can they make it disappear while it's in someone's stomach before it's fully solidified Actually, yes, a light bringer could, as long as it was soon enough after the moment of creation. I thought you were asking about sun forging, so sorry. I I should have been paying more attention. <laughs> oh, <that's interesting. laughs> um, but actually, yes, a, a light bringer could do that and <laughs> technically steal as long as it was soon enough after. That's the that would be the the sticking point there. Okay, cool. Um, Thanks. <laughs> but they wouldn't, of course, because that would be wrong. It would it would be a bit nasty. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't put it be beyond Arik as a practical joke. Um, he might do it to tease, but then give the food back and just like oh, maybe recreate it and, and let them eat it. Um, very good question, though. It was, a, it was a fun one. But thank you, Francis, for joining us. This has yeah. been a pleasure. Oh, did you have a question, Lloyd? Because you had something to say when we were saying goodbye. But if not... Oh, I, I think I was probably just saying good, goodbye, actually. Um, okay, okay, cool. <laughs> so well, thanks, Francis, again goodbye, for being guys. here. <laughs> Awesome. Now, is there any, a couple, uh, we'll try and answer a couple of questions in chat. Unfortunately, yeah. I can't see it. I know there'd be uh, you guys uh, um, uh, reacting and commenting and all, all that stuff. I've just usually, noticed I that you're, that. I just noticed, Shad, that you're going by Shad M. Brooks. Did, did you yes. gain a, a middle initial when you became a fantasy author? I did. It just sounds more official. It's like, you know, George R. R. Martin, J. R. Tolkien. It's like, it's, it's like, yeah, it's just, it's, it makes it sound, sound better. Shad M. Brooks fits now suddenly. Yeah, me and Francis have uh, Dylan L. D uh, Dion and Francis has uh, Francis L. Clarkson. So it's. And I've just got the two names. We were too poor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, Dylan. It's just. <laughs> uh, so, what? Uh, Shad is playing bad cop and Lloyd playing good cop. Uh, by, uh, Actually, it's a bit of both. But it's funny. Lloyd's character gets to do some intimidation. Um, uh, um, actions in the scene and so uh, there, there's a bit of a mix it's not strictly one or the other I, I think we're probably nice cop and nicer still cop oh yeah you know they're, they're they're very pleasant chaps but serious in certain certain circumstances about oh, certain okay. things but mm. uh, but you're right they're, they're they're nice guys i agree i have uh david shields who ask uh, lloyd uh, have you done any acting on screen before? Uh, well, uh, in lots of my own videos, um, of course. Um, and when I worked uh, at a studios in Pelor, I did some acting on, on the small screen, um, usually in other people's training films or corporates or, you know, little, little stuff. Um, I've never been in a, in a, a proper short film you know, the full budget, you know, with crew and everything done properly. Uh, but on, on my channel, um, I, I'd say a fair bit of what I've done in the past, I, I think comes under the, the broad category acting. Um, but you don't, don't we all of... act, act ourselves anyway? I mean, even Indeed. as I'm talking to you now, I'm just playing the part of someone who's a YouTuber who pretends <laughs> to know what the hell the answer to this question is. <laughs> so I can relate. Um, but you do have that series. It's like a pilot series or, or the documentary series um, that you did built a while Age. back. Yes, yeah. built for the Stone Age. And I thought they were actually really well made. And uh, and so I would kind of consider that somewhat type of, it is acting work, but you're, you're being more of a presenter in those those pieces. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. Well, I was also, yes, I was the presenter and the writer and the director and the lighting <laughs> man and the producer and the costumes. Oh, wow, that was an exhausting time. Yes. But I did, for some of those scenes, have a crew of one. So that was good. <laughs> and you've also done, like, theatre stage work um, outside of, like, school as well, haven't you? Because I remember you went to... There was some, uh, something, am I right, or am I missing? Uh, no, I've, I've done a bit here and there. Um, a friend of mine... Uh, uh, he writes in the style of Gilbert and Sullivan shows, mm -hmm. and I've been in, in several of his. Uh, and it's wonderful. Uh, the, the party to rehearsal ratio is really good because everyone else, they have to go to loads of rehearsals because they have to sing. And he just gives me an acting part. So I just turn up to two rehearsals and then I get the, the after party. So that's, that's a really good ratio of rehearsal to party. <laughs> um, I have another question from Rebecca Violet. Uh, uh, you may have discussed it in previous live streams, but what's the timeline for the release? Also, any travel concerns with the pandemic? Uh, I think well, that's, that's one that you can kind of answer. Yeah. Me, <laughs> so, uh, obviously, um, there are concerns with travel with the pandemic, and we mentioned it at the start of the stream, and basically we're going to have to wait for the restrictions to be lifted for us to shoot. Um, I don't think we can have Lloyd, uh, Shad, and the guys from Adoria come in, then um, seclude themselves for two weeks for, for us to then shoot for a week and for them to go back to their country and then they have to be in lockdown for another two weeks <laughs> mm. which i think would be a bit of of a waste of time for them so i think it's not doable to do it that way uh, we really have to wait for the restrictions to be uh, uh let down and that's why the we have a timeline on our kickstarter page so if you want to go to our kickstarter page there is a a tentative timeline of when the short film and the feature film could be released but the feature film is really speculative so mm. it, if yeah. everything goes well the short film should be released in a year english crossed <laughs> yeah i i, I, I have you, to be you, completely you, open about it because uh we don't have want to have any uh uh, mad fans that are are surprised that it's not come out uh, in one month. Uh, no, it's going to take... If everything goes well, we're going to shoot in October. And again, if everything goes well with the post-production, it's going to take three to six months of post-production and then we can release it. Mm. And that's if nothing goes sideways which there's always something that goes sideways and because people have been asking about the release how will they be able to watch it it's going to be published on my youtube channel for free for everyone to watch no no barriers or anything oh. uh, there will be a like a a pre kind of premiere which will be specifically for people who have backed the project and will be there to be part of it in chat it'll have to be an online premiere but after that yeah it's it's going to be online for everyone uh which i think is brilliant um so that's that's going to be exciting all right any other questions uh dylan before we move on um fantasy weapons versus sci-fi weapons which would win uh, that, uh, that depends <laughs> uh, what do you think lloyd <laughs> uh w w well if sci-fi is futuristic and and fantasy ah all right so fantasy is magic mm -hmm. is it ah oh well in, in that case it's entirely up to us isn't it we are the makers of magic so we just get to decide how powerful magic is if you want mm -hmm. to make it more powerful than the laser beam it is because magic <laughs> exactly like is that a death star magic <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes i mean well, like if you're doing good sci-fi you should do you should like mold the technology around logical um levels like uh, in terms of power levels but having said that you can justify some pretty absurd things like 
<laughs> they didn't justify it well, but you know, a, a space base the size of a moon that can destroy planets. Um, they they sold it enough. I mean, when you really break it down, it's there's there's a lot of issues with it. But <laughs> I do remember reading this thing where they uh, there was this type of magic which took energy from the environment, and they had these massive stone flywheels, and they would spend ages getting these flywheels getting up to speed and then uh, and, uh, and, uh, several tons of flywheel going round and round and round and then the, the magician would stand next to it cast the spell and the, the flywheel would just stop because all the energy had been taken out of it oh that is and interesting then, and then they had to spend the next uh, getting it going again just with muscle power because that's all they had <laughs> i actually really like that that like because it, it adds a good structural limitation, but also hmm. framework for the magic. That's do you know what series that's from? Because that's actually really cool. That's an inventive yeah. idea. The energy has uh, to come from somewhere. So yeah, I love it. That's uh, really really cool. Um, and uh, in my fantasy universe, the timeline goes from very from ancient times up to the sci 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 fi ish uh, era in which mm -hmm. magic and sci-fi weapons live together. That is very cool. And but you, then, you, if magic existed, it would just be technology, wouldn't it? I mean, if you can research a new spell, isn't that like inventing a gadget? Well, I think uh, Shad's universe is also a great example for that, I, where science and uh, magic live together. Yeah, I think what Jedi is funny, uh, you know, the, the division between science and magic and, you, you know, like saying it depends how much is understood about it is a, is a decent way. I mean, another division would be to say if it's founded on truly, like uh, truly fictitious elements, like there's an energy source that people are manipulating and things, but they do that in sci-fi as well. It's just generally the people controlling it. There are exceptions, but generally the people controlling it in sci-fi, it's not people, it's technology. But in, in a fantasy, it's people that can manipulate this energy or whatever fan, fancy kind of thing. And so there's a lot of different ways. Um, but I tend to like magic that has rules. That's what I did in my book. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of different variants and ways to approach it. And, uh, and indeed. But uh, th thank you for those questions, uh, uh, Dylan. And uh, I had... Did, uh, sorry, you... I, I was going into a next question. Oh, yeah, okay, one more. From Ethan Hedford. Shad, as the author, what's your biggest fear in regards to this short film? That I won't like it when it's made. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I, I'm confident in these guys, and I'm really excited that um, they'll be able to make something phenomenal, and we're all going to be doing our best to do it, but there's always that chance, you know? And so... Uh, yeah, we get, we'll be doing our best to avoid it. That's 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 our commitment, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so that, that's basically filmmaking's hard. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. It is, and it's a lot of planning, and that's w one thing that people don't consider. A lot of time, the blame goes against the actors or against the director, but there are so many cogs in a, the filmmaking industry there are gonna be more than 50 people working on that short film mm -hmm. uh, it can't be the fault of one person if something goes wrong and it can't be the fault of one person if everything goes mm -hmm. right uh, yeah, um, an interesting ways. example of something. Sorry, sorry, were you, I didn't, don't want to cut you off. Um, I was just saying an interesting example is like, I know I, I will criticize movies when they butcher certain elements of realism, like armor design is, is a one that usually comes up if it's out of period or it out, looks like absolute garbage and things. And, uh, and the question is like, like, how does this get past, you know, um, inspection to land in the, in a film? And there was one, um, uh, pi like, like, like picture that just looked horrendous. And I forget the film. I, the, it was the same actor that played Kylo Ren in the recent Star Wars films. And he was wearing this breastplate that just looked horrendous. And, uh, it turns out the reason for that one, this is, this is word of mouth. It could be wrong, but I'm just repeating something that someone told me. So, but it, it does, uh, um, play like uh, onto what you were saying there, Dylan, is that, 
turns out in that film, the uh, people getting the uh, the props and everything ended up only having a couple of weeks to get everything ready by time of shooting, and they had just to rush everything. And unfortunately, the byproduct is that things looked horrible, but they did the best they could with the circumstances and time they had. Still look pretty bad, but they, but that explains it, and those are the difficulties that people can run into. And I can so. uh, say something about that. Uh, when we went to mm -hmm. our uh, partners that are going to ma manufacture the costumes, um, they told us that we were some of the most organized they've worked with so far because they've worked with so many projects that arrive one week or two before the, the shooting dates and that asked, well, we have no budget and we have no time for you to make the costumes but make something that is 100% custom. <laughs> Good luck, right? Um, mm. And we've had uh, talks with uh, weapon manu manufacturers as well, who are like, well, it can take weeks or months to create weapons or armor that are going to be decent. And productions come in and just want that to be done in two days or something like that. Yeah, my goodness. All righty. Well, um, <clears throat> we've talked a lot about the film and uh, and so that's been absolutely awesome. I've had a great time with it. And I, I also want to thank everyone who's backed it. Um, it's phenomenal. It is getting made. And, uh, you know, we're having Lloyd be a part of it, which is going to be heaps exciting. We've got great people working on it. Um, Dawson is amazing. And, uh, you know, Dylan and Francis are doing a great job, um, which is absolutely awesome. But we also, but the thing is, we have Lloyd here. Um, and so we have to take the opportunity just to, to spit the wind. Is that, is that just an Australian saying or is it? Um, uh, I, I know what you meant. Um, yeah. <laughs> I got a feeling we, it, it's something similar to that. By the way, in answer to your earlier question, iRobot. The version with Will Smith. That has oh. nothing to do with the film. If you've read the Asimov book, um, essentially it's a film that has robots in it, and it's called iRobot, and I've run out of similarities with the book. <laughs> so that that, that is, one I hmm. Yeah, like and I do get a bit of a divided position because I have to admit, I, I did enjoy the film enough. Uh, and so like I, w I part of me wishes I would love to see a more accurate adaptation. Yet I wouldn't want to see the film non-existent. It's like, and so, it's hard to, like that. That yeah, that puts me in a rock and a hard place with that one. Well, don't um, call it iRobot then. That's a good point, actually. Call it Will Smith versus the robots. Robots. That's a very good point. They they seem to just want to use the um the fan base or of a pre-existing property and then make whatever the hell they want. Um. And uh, there are some atrocious examples lately. Like, I have never read Artemis Fowl. I don't know if it's a good book or not. All I know is that the recent movie has been trashed in the have, reviews. Have you seen it? And, no, I haven't even seen the film because I, it was I've got, watched it and it, it is trash. Uh, really, <laughs> it was uh, not enjoyable. It was too fast paced. Nothing was, well, everything was explained, but nothing was shown. That's uh, hmm. a common error that they make. Yeah, and uh, and uh, so there there have been some atrocious adaptations more recently, and other ones that you know do a decent job, uh, and sometimes that do they really good, and then they kind of like Game of Thrones, they started great, and then uh, there was a bit of a stumbling towards the end. Um, but yeah, so it's always uh, like when it, when dealing with adaptations, it can be a complete like. Um, random result if it's going to be either accurate or good uh, those are the mm -hmm. two big ones um and uh, and a lot of the uh, it seems like a lot of the issues that happens is uh, a lot the authors just get locked out of getting solid input the one that disappointed me um if you're going to ask me about adaptation uh probably ender's game i love ender's game the novel it is a brilliant one and uh, and the movie it worked on some levels but it didn't reach how awesome the book was by far and uh, and so you know that's unfortunate and again they basically like awesome scott card is a savagely intelligent guy he can be hugely critical like if you ever watch him in an interview he will just he has views and he'll just throw them out there and i can respect that even though i might not agree with all the hot takes he has but Tell you what, he has some good views on 
how his story should be. He's the author. Of course he knows the, the nature and core of the characters and the better ways that they can be conveyed and things. And and they on, that not only did they not take um, use him as a resource in terms of making the film, they specifically contradicted fundamental things he had tried to get in the contract itself, but they put in a loophole in the contract so they could then do the exact opposite of the things that they were even committing towards. And so that is almost like a nightmare for me um, if my uh, book ever gets adapted into film, is just seeing someone do whatever the hell they want with it. And which has made me really reluctant even considering, um, uh, you know, allowing people to uh, make adaptations and stuff. And I and uh, I haven't even sold the feature film rights yet. Uh, Drowdy Productions, they have the rights to make a short film. And that's why I'm like, Let's see what you can put together, fellas. Let's see what you can make. And Whoa. um and uh and I, they've been impressing me at every turn. And so, you know, the possibility of a feature is absolutely there. And so if ever funding get if we get funding, that's something we can push, uh, pursue. Mm. But um yeah, it is something that I like I've been very hesitant about. Um and just giving off all the rights. And and so that's kind of where I was at in terms of selling it to Hollywood and things, even though Hollywood isn't interested in it as of yet, but I think there is there is a certain amount of job justification in mm -hmm. in studios. So uh, they'll bring some studio exec will take on the project, and if he just says, "Yeah, tick, I like that one, do it," Vum, he hasn't done anything. He's not shown his expertise. He hasn't added any value to that product. So mm -hmm. he feels it's necessary for him to inter interfere. And then he can say, oh, yeah, when they were originally when they brought it to me, I said, oh, this this act is too long and this character doesn't add enough and this character needs a sidekick and we need a funny dog in it. And one thing they particularly love doing is changing the title because then the whole film becomes their idea. So Shadow of the Conqueror, if it becomes um, uh, Conqueror of the Shadows or whatever, then that that um, uh, studio exec, oh yeah, yeah, I, I I created Conqueror of the Shadows. He will be able truthfully to say in that he changed the title to that. And if the video does great, it's all thanks to them. And if it does poorly, it's everyone else's fault. <laughs> oh, oh, doubtless, doubtless. Yeah. <laughs> Door um, studio execs. <sighs> yeah, I mean, uh, you hear some you hear some of these horror stories about the meddling that can happen. I mean. Sure, Rise of Skywalker, I won't even get started on. Anyway, um, <laughs> but it's pretty cool. Like, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned this at the beginning, but this is the first time me and Lloyd has ever even had the opportunity to just talk directly like this, which is brilliant. And so we're probably going to steer things towards that way just to just to have a bit of a chat, really. Um, and yeah. you guys can still have the opportunity to ask questions and everything. But uh, one thing that I would love to get your insight on, Lloyd, is... Uh, is one of the, I guess, themes of your channel where there's obviously a focus on historical accuracy and, uh, and a push towards getting things more authentic, even mm -hmm. in fantasy, but obviously a greater focus on uh, if it's a period piece, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. why, do you, why do you feel that's an important kind of thing to promote and, uh, and to uh, aim for? Um, because when I pay my money and I go to the cinema, uh, I want to be taken to another world and mm -hmm. anything that pops the balloon reminds me that i'm watching a movie so if, if the acting is bad i recognize that it's acting and i'm reminded that these people are actually actors and then i'm sitting in a cinema smelling the popcorn i'm not in that world because the acting was bad if the special effects are bad i i spot that they are special effects which reminds me that i'm just watching a film which pops the balloon again and I'm back into the cinema. I don't want to be in a cinema. I, I pay for escapism, damn it. I want to be immersed in this believable world. And if there's a massive anachronism, oh, then um, that, that pops the balloon again. Now, you might argue, but not everyone in the audience knows it. it's an anachronism. But actually, I think when people see the real thing, even if they don't know why, they appreciate, oh, yeah, it was like that. Uh, you don't have to be an expert for verisimilitude to help with immersion. Uh, I agree completely. Just on that note, um, I don't mean to cut you off. It's just that um, because 
if realism exists, like the things, basically what I'm trying to say is things were done because they were in, for good, practical, sometimes even fashionable reasons, but they were done for reasons that made mm -hmm. sense once you understand them. And when you adopt those same, you know, realistic elements, even if in fantasy, because they have such a logical basis, usually, I, I admit some things you look at like, where the hell did that come from in the history? But then when you research, you can find out. But generally, there is a very explainable reason for it. And when that's added into, especially if it's period, but even in fantasy, mm. it, 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 inc it increases the believability because it has that practical grounded sense, especially if you look at armor and things like um, realistic armor looks realistic and functional because it is funnily mm. enough. Yeah. One, one, thing, uh, and, uh, oh. one thing I Sorry, think that, that was, I could say about uh, period piece is that people, uh, a lot of people watch a uh, period movie and think that it's accurate and they're gonna take things from it and say well this is how the medieval times were uh how many people have watched let's say braveheart and thought that that's how uh it was back i don't think a anyone has watched braveheart and thought that was i mean oh well, that, I, this well, is the thing. That is I one of to... the least accurate movies ever made. But I, I know. But actually, no, it, it's a good example, actually, because there was, on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, there was a shop called the Braveheart Shop, and it was there for a few years, and it sold tourist tat Scottishness to, to <laughs> Scots and tourists. And there was a Braveheart, I think it was referred to as the Braveheart effect, and it, it actually supposedly was responsible for a shift uh, of votes towards the Scottish Nationalist Party and a, a lot of eating of shortbread. Um, <laughs> and wow, that film was so inaccurate. It was jaw dropping in uh, almost I every know. possible way. Uh, well, this is the thing, right? I mean, when you say who would be fooled by it, me. <laughs> like when you, when you come into, cause like as a kid, swords are awesome. Knights, they look cool, action, fighting. And so you come in knowing nothing. And then the very first thing you get depicted is uh, Kevin Costner. Like my, this is still, you know, nostalgia, still one of my favorite films. There's, there are issues with it. But what Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves with Kevin Costner, right? Is one of the first introductions to the medieval world as a kid that I experienced. Oh dear. Oh yeah, dear. exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. And, oh with, and with knowing nothing, that was medieval to me. You know, like, look at the studded leather everywhere and all these things. Like, there is some howlers, right? But because I didn't know any better, that actually educated me falsely as to what medieval was. And then it created a self-perpetuating myth because when I, exactly. then now when I go and as a kid, when I went into medieval, that's the aesthetic I was expecting because that's what I had been conditioned to receive because it was the only thing I had seen. And, he, and then Braveheart is another example because... I actually didn't know when kilts were introduced, but I see this period, they're all wearing kilts. It's like, okay, yeah, Scots, kilts, but they must have wear. And of course, kilts were introduced way later after, you know, um, uh, the events in Braveheart. Uh, yes, and they didn't paint themselves with blue woad either. Exactly, exactly. Braveheart didn't have a massive two-handed claymore. William Wallace, the uh, Battle of Stirling Bridge, didn't even have a bloody bridge in it, you know? <laughs> and, like, um there yeah, there's a clue in the name, guys. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, there are howlers in Braveheart or Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, but because, you know, young being young, I didn't know any better. I just, mm. that was it. And that's where I feel inaccuracies do a disservice to history when they're not, uh, because in a lot of instances, and look, I might be speaking out of a place of ignorance here, mm. but in a lot of instances, I feel... It wouldn't it would be as much effort to get things accurate as the effort you went to in the inaccuracies like putting oh, all these studs on leather yes. takes a lot of work i mean oh yes so, yes sometimes they seem to go out of their way to get it wrong yes exactly and, and it happens for instance in britain where we have these uh, wonderful reenactment societies and they, they they recruit they want a load of people to play some medieval whatnot so they, they recruit from reenactment societies and people turn up in their meticulously researched down to the last stitched accurate kit and the costume people take one look at it and go oh no that'll never work and then they give them over <laughs> sackcloth and and then throw buckets of shit over them oh that's depressing <laughs> 
because I don't like my my thought when I ever see these horrible kind of you know you know um, all the extras in the this horrible armor. I, I my my reaction was why don't they get the reenactors at resource as resources? And you're telling me they do, and then they give them crap instead of what they have. That is uh, depressing. It, it, embarrassing. Yes, I know this has happened to several people I know. Um, oh gosh, no, that's horrible. Yeah, because oh. as we all know, you can look at medieval paintings and all the people are wearing bright colours, but as we all know, really, because we've watched movies, everything was brown or black and everyone was covered in mud <laughs> because the damp cloth uh, wasn't invented until the 1960s. <laughs> and it, yes, it, and uh, like if a you're a bad guy, you have to be wearing a black hood, obviously. Well, yeah, because yeah. it's well, that, that's causation. It's, it's, it's wearing black hoods send you bad. I know, and especially, like, I feel sorry for Sinestro. He, like, you know, what is he supposed to do given a name like that from birth? It's like, gee, I, I'm sorry. It's just it's what's going to happen, mate. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, what, absolutely. I'll go. One, one interesting exception is a film which I think is better than the book, which is Dangerous Liaison. Have you seen that? I have not, in fact. Oh, see it. It's, I can't. Uh, it's a hoot. It's really good. Um, and the book was written um, ooh, in the 18th century, I believe. Um, it, and it was an epistolatory um, book, you know, like Dracula. It's all in letter form. And they, they changed it in a number of ways for the film. One thing is that they set it earlier. So they set it in uh, about 30 years before when people were wearing the enormous wigs and everyone had powdered faces and incredibly elaborate costumes. Um, and it actually sort of suits the story a bit better, maybe, to have put well, it. Well, no, back. I agree. Yeah, um, I agree. Changes like that can be done if and mm. and they can actually enhance the source material when they're done with consideration and actual understanding of the source material. Because we're not saying that every adaptation, if it's a historical adaptation into the real world, um, that tweaks to realism are always bad like my my point of reference is usually fight scenes because in reality most fight scenes are one to two exchanges and then that's it <laughs> okay that's what well, that's how they play out in the real world yet in a in a film setting where you want something heroic and engaging i got kind of all right I, i'm I, for myself i'm actually a bit okay with pushing realism to get a fight scene that's more elaborate and drawn out to be more epic and heroic and, even, and that's even if it's in a, a historical setting because mm. uh, it's more enjoyable, put, put, put simply. Um, and, and so... I, I think you can have a, a historical fight that drives oh, yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you, have a duel, if you have a duel with two guys in full plate armor, it can last quite a long time before mm -hmm. one of the, guy go, the guys go down. Uh, it's yes. just... Um, I, I should redeem myself and I was saying, and, and just clarify that, um, uh, I'm not saying... Uh, use horrible techniques and bad stances and over swinging and the spinning around crap in fight scenes i hate all that i'm talking about that the length and uh, and in the amount of engagements and stuff um, yeah uh, but i mean if you watch an mma fight sometimes you know it oh, goes right. it, it goes right. for five rounds and those guys are expert punches and they're hitting each other really hard in the face over and over again and sometimes the first punch wins it <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And because it'll come down to a word that I think we're all familiar with here, uh, context. <laughs> uh, uh, no, where is he? Is he coming? No, he's where we're safe. We might have gone. We might have um, avoided the Matty. You, 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 um, you can put him in in post. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have some people but, in yeah, the chat that, uh, that are asking if we're reading the chat. And I want to ask you, Shad, do you want to answer any questions about the film or do I just skip to questions about... Uh... No, no, I think we should try and answer some you know, questions in the chat. I can't see it at the moment, unfortunately, but um, we will pause to uh, um, do uh, um, uh, some, co some uh, yeah, questions I didn't want to in between our general with, discussion. Uh... But I will finish off what I was saying is that absolutely, it's always a matter of context because there are times when a wholly realistic fight scene that does only last a few engagements works way better for the given scene and for the type of film and everything like that. And so when I say that to, you can tweak realism, it's always going to be a case by case basis and what works for what you want to achieve. And that's kind of the, the mindset mm. they want to approach. But overall, I generally do feel erring on the side of stuff that creates more immersion, especially accuracy, if it's uh, dealing with historical or historically inspired material, 
generally has a much greater chance of enhancing the work instead of being a detriment to it. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for things happening off screen. Uh, sometimes what you don't see is more powerful. Uh, there, I, I think a lot of films, particularly since CGI has become a thing, now that you can show the thing because you can CGI it, but it used to be impossible, they sort of feel it's necessary to show it. And sometimes it lowers the impact. In in um, the the black and white, um, oh, uh, a David Lean version of uh, Oliver Twist, when Nancy is being murdered by Bill Sykes, it, you, you mm. don't see it. What you see is Bill's dog trying to get out of the room frantically. And in the background, mm. you hear a woman being beaten to death. And it's really powerful. Yeah. Uh, whereas today, some studio exec would say, oh, no, 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 you, you'd have to show her head being bashed in. We want blood and what have you. We need to be able to show it all. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually watching that dog trying to get, I don't want to be in this room, says the dog, by the way it moves. It's, whoa, that's, it's, that's visceral and powerful. And one way to do a very effective fantasy fight could be you, you see a door and then you hear stuff and then you see little flashes of light come through the cracks in the door. And then after a pause, the door opens and the guy covered in blood walks out. <laughs> and it, it all happened in your head. And sometimes... Sometimes that can that 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 can be better. Uh, that's actually a writing tool I also employ in my in my work, where I know that someone's imagination would be able to create something far grander than I could explain in detail, and it would take way too long if I tried to explain it in such detail. And so that's when I can resort to using descriptive kind of broader statements like. Their, their sword fighting reflected a dance that was so complex and yet so sophisticated and something like that. And just saying something like that paints or gives someone a, a, a jumping point to paint a picture that is far greater than what I could have actually written. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so, it, it's a, yeah, it's always a balancing act. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, um, you can really use some creative things to, because people have imaginations. Um, but we'll quickly pause to answer some questions, um, uh, Dylan, before we continue. Okay. So, Shad, what rank of the sword do you think you would be? Low. <laughs> you know what? I have a more, I have a stronger book um, um, understanding of swordsmanship than practical. And I, and I also, I like to hedge my bets because... Uh, to get a to be out of state exactly where I am at with my swordsmanship ability, I would want to have been tested far more more recently than I have been. But I, do, I have uh, scant opportunities to keep up training, and so because of that, I uh, tend to uh, uh, purposely err on the side of uh, uh, giving a lower estimation of where my swordsmanship would be at. So if I ever do have an aspiring match that ends up as a video, and I, I, I there's a chance I might oh, perform better. Uh, but if I don't, I didn't set anyone's expectations on my own too high, and so I'm safe. But my academic understanding of swordsmanship, I, sometimes I just watch Hema duels and fight scenes and just kind of deconstruct what they're doing in slow motion because I'm so engaged and I love what they're doing. And then, you know, trying to understand differences uh, between Fiore and Lichtenau and all those, all those fun things um, and stuff. Uh, but what about you, Lloyd? Because um, that is a question that can be applied to you as well. Where do you think you are as a swordsman? Uh, right. Was there, is there a scoring system from your book? Is that is that what the question was phrased? Is well, there actually is, but I only mainly mentioned the um, the masterships. <laughs> my my son is okay. Um, uh, um, I don't know if if I go to a Hema uh, uh, competition, and I do have a silver medal for Hema over there. Um, I will generally not win because it tends to be a set of rules which have to be brought in for partly for safety and there are people who are more sort of athletic and more competitive than me and you usually have i don't know it's first to ten or something so there are lots of um but i like to think and maybe here i'm just trying to self-justify and self-aggrandize i don't know but i like to think that if ever i were in a real fight where it's just first to one and it's absolutely no holds barred then i am actually quite good at doing something that the other guy really wasn't expecting it's but funny a, i've kind of yeah i get what you're saying in a competition that, that that that'll get you a point 
mm-hmm. and then he's then he's seen that trick and he won't fall for it again. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But I... Outside of a competition, um, yeah. Uh, uh, I, but that's I, I get exactly what you're saying because that's actually a lot. Sometimes I think about that a lot as well, and you go through scenarios because you're right. It's like in a real fight, it's whoever gets the first hit in, and then all right, what's kind of a yeah, like, good point there, sir. I, I I, one one of my most successful techniques when fighting people who are not familiar with me is not stopping. Uh, what everyone expects you to do is walk up to 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 measure distance and then stop because that's what everybody does. They fought a thousand bites, bouts, and that's what everyone does. So they have their swords, they walk to here, and then they stop, and then they do this for a bit. Mm-hmm. And I find that, um, again, he won't fall for it twice, but if I just walk up to him and then just don't stop and hit him, it, whoa, shit, he did, what the hell? <laughs> Catching him off guard. Yeah. Um, and I've, yeah. And I, I, I particularly remember once it was a big group thing, and I, I routed a group of about ten people by just by walking straight at the first guy and not stopping. And, and it just there was this bamboozling effect. He then fell back, and then everyone else fell back. And this, <laughs> this is quite effective. This, uh, but of course, I wasn't in any actual danger of actually dying. Mm-hmm. So, would I ever have done that in real life? Yeah, that is the that's the question, isn't it? Like, it's it's hard to try and see, like, even comment on what how we would perform if it's really real, I am a, or that any such an event would ever happen. So, hmm. um, in in I mean, one one major thing that you can do in a real fight, which reenactors won't do, a HEMA people won't do, is you destroy the other guy's kit, you smash his shield up, you bend his sword. Hmm. You uh, and there are an awful lot of techniques which which involve just destroying the other guy's kit. But uh, if you did that to a reenactor or a hemo, he'd be seriously pissed off with you, and with good reason. So, oh yeah, yeah that, absolutely. That, that one's yeah. that one's off the off the menu of options. And the other thing that um, uh, and th- this is not me saying it. This is actually you know hemo practitioners who have openly mentioned it is uh, um, a difficulty to try and keep realistic is. Uh, fighting after a, after getting hit okay because usually yeah. you can actually risk getting hit if it leaves your person open for a more devastating counter attack um mm-hmm. but with point general point scoring systems they can't account for that because you can't determine how lethal a hit was or if it was survivable and other things like that, and it makes it a, a difficult situation um yeah. But that is an interesting thing that does exist in the real world. Is like, all right, I might, I might allow myself getting a, a, a shallow cut on the side if I can notice that he's not doing putting a lot of power behind them to just run him through in the heart, you know. And so, yeah, it's it's an interesting, interesting thought process there. Um, but yeah, I remember uh, when, uh, no, no, you go. Well, it's just another example of the same thing, really. I can remember back from my LARP days uh, when I fought with a mace. Um, because it's a mace and the haft is blunt, people think they can grab it. So I would hit someone, whack on the elbow, and he would then go, ha-ha, and grab my mace. And I just thought, well, no. If you've just been whacked really hard on the elbow with a mace, <laughs> you're not going to be in any position to, to grab the haft of my mace. That's Sorry, mate, that's not going to happen. But they were going, ha-ha, I grabbed your mace, see? And in... In the fight system we were using, he had maybe two points on that arm, so he took one point damage and then grabbed my mace. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. there might be a couple, a number of other things going through your mind if you're getting pummeled on the arm with a flipping mace. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, all right, so next question there, Dylan. We'll, we'll um, try there is a uh, Gambit who asks Shad if there a way to get a signed copy of your book. Uh, yes, but it will require meeting me in person at the moment. There's no uh, sold signed copies yet. And so if I'm doing a meet and greet, I, and, the, and the difficult thing is meeting me in person then because uh, locked down other things and I'm not exactly traveling or, but who knows in the future. But unfortunately, you would, you would need to meet me in person um, because I can't guarantee if you're going to post something out that I will even receive it or be able to post it back um, because it, it kind of opens the floodgates and then it takes way too much time. And I can't be spending all the time um, signing things and sending them back to people who are sending them to me and stuff. And so, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult right now. It's, it's, there are challenges for signed copies, um, but I know people are wanting them. So 
I don't know. I, there, there was one thing that me and my wife were trying to set up with uh, uh, an actual local bookstore that we could just deliver him a whole heap of signed copies and then you could purchase signed copies through our website. It's a lot of work to set up and say, mate, oh, hopefully I'll be able to sort something out. Yeah, that, that's, that's that for now. There's also uh, Jay Hadley. Are you, too, are you worried that being too faithful to the book may hurt the film? Um, no, because uh, we're like when it comes to adaptation, I knew from the get-go that you would have to make concessions in many areas because it's an adaptation. A book is not a film. A book is usually much longer. You need to cut stuff. You need to condense things. And so uh, um, uh, I, my worry is... Uh, And I don't, I'm not worried about being too faithful to the book because we're not being too faithful to the book. We have made the appropriate con condensing and cuts and changes yes, and have. stuff. We have. Exactly. So um, uh, that will be that one. Um, but maybe one more question and then we'll continue back to a, well, bit, of a uh, bit of a discussion. I, I had a few quick ones uh, that I'll answer. There's one uh, that was asking, uh, J Johnny Reb was asking about Scal and his involvement. Uh, Scal has addressed it in his last live stream. He has personal things that he's taking care of, so he's not currently working on with us on that project. Uh, there's also uh, a few people that have asked about the uh, song lyric contest that we have made. Um, and we have selected uh, a few and we have contacted them. And we're working with them to make a song. It's just taking a lot longer than we were expecting. Um, and then a, a, one last question for both of you. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever been to Canada? And how long will you be in Canada when filming comes? I have been to Canada once. I went to Niagara and Toronto And I danced on the deck of a ship that went around the lake uh, next to Toronto that uh, danced to a jazz band, the Climax Jazz Band. I even remember the name of the band. Um, and and the bass player was called Chris Daniels. There you go. Um, and I, I expect if I'm going to go all that way, I will want to uh, to see a bit more. Uh, there, there's videos to make with, in, with the likes of Shad. Um, it's not impossible that I might even meet the illustrator of... Uh, Uh, in search of Hannibal, who lives in Canada. Unfortunately, he lives quite some distance from where you plan to shoot. But, you know, it's, it's in Canada. So it's a bit like saying, oh, well, while, while you're in Berlin, you may as well see Moscow. But, yeah, even so. Um, <laughs> it's being on the continent. Um, <laughs> and it is a long way to go for a, a, a short gig. I mean, one, one thing that really appeals to me about Canada is it's the, the, the large areas of wilderness And uh, something which enormously appeals to me is, is spending some while trying to live uh, using primitive technology. Uh, but there's just one, just one little niggling thing. Uh, apparently, if you stay for more than about four days in any one place in Canada, you know, building shelters and, and putting out traps and so forth and, and you know, doing the hunter-gatherer stuff, The bears find you. And I then was going to say, is it the bears? Because it's <laughs> like, like, that would be my worry. <laughs> Canada is really appealing, apart from being eaten by a bear, which is not the way I want to go. Well, I haven't <laughs> been eaten by a bear yet. I haven't seen no, one No, but you ever. live in a city. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been in not the wild, too. Yeah, well, I'm told, I'm told it's about four days. You know, if you're, if you're trapping and, and hunting and building up... I've you're never gone on hunting, though, so... Uh, yeah, the bears would be my concern. I mean, even in Australia, though, it's the snakes that are concerned. But, you know, you, you get used to ways to deal with those. Um, but sorry, I, 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 was there anything else you want to mention, Lloyd? Oh, uh, uh, no. So I'm, I would go for the filming plus a, a week or two. It's probably the most I could, I could spare, really. Mm. And that would be about the same for me. Um, the the shooting uh, window is what two weeks, Dylan? I believe uh, it's and one then... week plus uh, one rehearsal week before, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. And and then uh, probably in addition another two weeks um, uh, that I'd try and combine. Maybe I might be able to combine it with uh, a detour to the US 
to visit certain um, associates, but that's up in the air. So, uh, um, uh, and I would need more firm dates as well. As to if I've ever been to Canada, no, I've never been to Canada. Um, this will be the first trip there. I've been to the US. Um, and so uh, I'm looking forward to it. In fact, there is a very, very nice castle-like hotel that I might have to visit uh, because it, it, it looks like a castle. Well, it's not a real castle. But it's castle. No, it's, and it looks fancy. It, it's <laughs> castle-like, yes. It's mm -hmm. not a castle. Uh, awesome. well, yeah, but all the, if you come to Britain, all, all of the real castles... I know. Well, they're, that's... They're, that's... <laughs> yeah, but they're rubbish as film locations because they're all old. <laughs> <laughs> if it's meant to be the 13th century don't you can't shoot it in a 13th century castle because it's it looks 700 years old <laughs> that is that is very very true in fact i like they they miss out on a lot of important um facts about castles because of that like the fact that a lot of them were whitewashed on the outside or mm -hmm. you know and you've even pointed this out on the inside and we had paintings and murals and all this color and everything oftentimes oh, but yeah, the inside it, would have been plastered. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and 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 because people do film in like real located, you know, location castles, it's created a trope that it's always bare stone and it's dark and mm. dank and wet or, or damp at least. Um, yeah. and, and unfortunately has created a lot of misconceptions about castles as a result, which is unfortunate because oh, castles are awesome. I mean, you know, We're just gonna have to better. wait for Get Along Castle to be finished and go oh, through there. It's looking great. <laughs> That's exciting for me. Um, and who knows? Maybe I'll be able to build a couple of my own. That's kind of my long-term goals. As well. Will you be adding any maculations to any of the sets for the film? Oh, that's a uh, Dylan. <laughs> uh, any maculations? Is that how you say it? Have I been saying it wrong my whole life? Uh. How do you say it? Matriculations. <laughs> I, I, you know, you're just saying it with an Australian accent, and that's fine. My, my whole life is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually been trying to find out if there is a more accurate pronunciation for it because I okay. have to, uh, heard. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the way I've always <laughs> said it. Uh, you would know, though, because uh, you're, you're like that. You're closer to the, you know, cultures where <laughs> such words are used. I'm as I'm, I'm this brutish Australian that just sees the phonetic pronunciation. Closer, but let us not forget that the way I speak is not the way people spoke in the 14th century. This is this is true. This is true. Uh, you know, light and night used to be licht, 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 or even licht. Sometimes the G was pronounced so licht and nicht. Uh, I can remember um, a load of German exchange students watched a play that my, that uh, came that, that a lot of people called the, the medieval players. They came to perform at our school and they did a play in Old English. And the Germans in the audience said, oh, this is weird. It was like watching a, a, a someone who doesn't quite speak my language right. Really? That's oh, yeah, it was it was it sounded much closer to German. Lots of so. so mm -hmm. you know, and it was night and it's for in and it's for nicht. Oh, it was night. Well, okay, right. <laughs> now, yeah, well, there you go. I mean, you know, I mean, like, it's funny. I matriculate. Oh, maculations. I, I, can't, I wonder if I can change it now because it's uh, become yeah, a because meme on my I'm, channel. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize <laughs> you ruined my life. Boy. Well, I, you must think I'm, I was trying to correct you or something. I was. I was I, genuinely not conscious I of how was, you said it. I, I'm so used to hearing Shad say it that I didn't even understand what you were talking about. Okay, but now you know the holes on the outside of, of, of battlements, right? For dropping stuff. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, will there be matriculations in the, the film? I, I might have the, to make like a question? full correction. I was wrong video in shame. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry. You know, we have been saying it wrong the whole time. Like, I would love to get confirmation on that because what is the origin of the word? It's not French, is it? Is it more uh, German, Germanic? Um, uh, well, obviously the, the ending isn't, the Asian bit. Um, mm -hmm. um, don't know. I, I wouldn't. I. I. I don't want. To, I don't want to say. So I, I could guess, but I don't want to be wrong. There's no point. Okay. Okay. I have to try and look it up because I know when I've looked up the etymology, all I got was interesting translations. It's like you know, head splitter, death from above, kind of you know, has this interesting translation. A kind of means, and so oh, yes. And, and another point with authenticity, of course, spelling was only standardized 
mm-hmm. uh, in sort of the 18th, 19th century, and still, even now, is changing a bit. Um, and uh, do you know, that, for instance, that in all the, every single instance we have of Shakespeare writing his own name, he spells it differently. Does he? Is it? That every is single, interesting. That's his own a- name. See, I didn't know it went that far. That's a, actually a really interesting data point I, I'm going to latch yeah. on to. And until, uh, until the printing press, um, different dialects in England were really mm. quite different. Yeah, everything was spelt phonetic and there was okay, barely so, any... So, so no there, there, will have, there will have been a dozen ways to say it if even I, then. If I so can you, interject... You're all right. Okay, what, I've got what, an out. What excuse. Wikipedia says... <laughs> What Wikipedia says, so we don't know if it's a reliable source. I'm just... Uh, it, well, no, it says, it's Wikipedia. It says it's based on French machicouli. Uh, so, so, ch or que? Machicouli or ch? So, machicouli. 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 machicouli uh, would, would be... Machicouli. Machicouli. Oh, <laughs> I'm so, it so would bad be with French. To magi- uh, it would be closer to machiculations. Then, uh-huh. all right. Well, I, I, <laughs> you you can't rely on on a on a French etymology. It's just you know, <laughs> um, I, I, well, my ultimate out is um, the Australian accent because the Australian accent just butchers so many words and pronunciations. I can always fall back on that. Like, I'm Australian. We're, we're experts at butchering languages. <laughs> it's 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 all fine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so things are going really well. It's been like awesome discussions. Um, perhaps it's time to start winding things up. But on the way to uh, winding it up, so Lloyd, what would mm-hmm. be um, your most despised uh, film that um, is uh, like the best example of atrociously adapting a medieval period? It can be fantasy. It can be history. Um, oh. What do you think is the worst? What does it the worst? Um, uh, it's a little bit boring if I, if I pick Braveheart now because that's already <laughs> mentioned. Um, but it, it was particularly reprehensible. Not only was it so unrealistic in terms of costumes and setting and have you, but it also it had an agenda. It was sort of aggressively, aggressively inaccurate. They changed all sorts of things in order to make the English better bad guys and the Scots better goodies, and they even had it, Irish, it- they even had Irish fighting on the Scottish side. What? And the the whole reason for the war was changed. I mean, to give you an example, in the in the film, he uh, doesn't attack Carlisle, where in reality he murdered all the nuns in Carlisle Abbey. But presumably they didn't think that was a heroic thing to show. Um, uh, but he attacks York and takes it. He never got anywhere near York. He attacked Newcastle and got his ass handed to him. You know, <laughs> that, that is, but you know, they just wanted to, it, it was, it, it, it suited them uh, to, to show the English being beaten up by the, by the Scots at that point. And presumably the execs thought, oh, no one's heard of Newcastle. Let's have him attack York. People mm-hmm. have heard of that. Um, yeah, that's that's a, an interesting pet peeve you've touched on there that annoys me is when they actually go out of their way to malign the character of historical figures to have a, a distinct protagonist and antagonist in a given film of a story. When I, I like that bothers me a lot, especially when either it's grey and we don't know, and there's actually a, a certainly like a pros and cons, like what you mentioned with um, with William Wallace and. Uh, um, uh, uh robert the bruce is the same uh, like he's, mm-hmm. he did some pretty vicious violent stuff as well and uh, of course the villain is always good old Longshanks. but from the english perspective he was actually a pretty solid king you know he did some and so it, it becomes to a matter of perspective and, and and elements and of course there's always the historical context where things that we would think are horribly violent and brutish from our own perspective are actually you know, in some cases, more understandable in the historical context, given the nature of warfare and other things. I mean, mm-hmm. but but yeah, so that seems I, 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 I just wanted to I, I emphasize that point even more about how characters are altered to give the protagonist or antagonist element. And it can really skew a historical depiction. Yeah, I just I find that. Um characters who are a shade of grey are just much more interesting. 
Mm-hmm. And honestly, like I would, uh, I would love a depiction of uh, Longshanks that is more fair and balanced because he's, he's always depicted as such a, a vicious villain. And admittedly, they did a bit better with um, with Outlaw King, but he's still pretty, you know, pretty much mm. the villain, and especially his son. Um, it, like I would almost even like a, a film that tried to show the nuance, like the the proper nuance because it's just gone very far that he's always and look admittedly he did some pretty pretty vicious things i'm not saying he didn't but there's perspective that should be uh, accounted for um a good example of a film that raised the bar i thought was even though it did get loads of things wrong uh, was saving private ryan and mm-hmm. since saving private ryan uh it's quite clear that you, you see a post Saving Private Ryan World War II film, and you can tell. Yeah. Because you, you, you couldn't go back to what, the way they used to do things before that. And yeah. there are elements of that where it's, it's the sort of thing where a studio exec would have said, oh, no, we can't have that. People won't accept it. For instance, a, when they're landing on the beach right at the start, uh, their rifles are in plastic bags. Mm-hmm. But because so much is right, and people can see that they've gone to so much effort and it sort of makes sense. Oh, yeah, they probably would have them in plastic bags because you wouldn't want to get your rifle wet immediately at the start of a battle when you're trying to get off, off a landing boat onto the, onto the shore. So, yeah, they would have given everyone a plastic bag. And so in that context, the audience did accept it. Oh, yeah. Of co- and even if they hadn't thought of it, they'd be going, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, they would have given them plastic bags to put their guns in. And it's just one of those logical, realistic elements that it doesn't need to be anyone to comment on. You can see it and just put the pieces together and it can actually enhance a film. Um, and it, just just on the note of World War II, I do have to admit, like, your World War II content is the thing that sparked my interest in World War II. And for me, before then, it was always medieval. But, mm-hmm. like, when you started making your videos on tanks and everything like that, it actually did open up the uh, the whole realization of what adam like both amazing and insane period of time that was and it's just wow um so now it was I'm, I'm an actually, amazing generation that lived through that oh, yeah like unbelievably so um and the things that people sacrificed and endured and went through it's just staggering and the other thing is like so much of what we benefit for in the modern day was preserved because of what people fought for back then as well and it's yeah it's absolutely amazing and so uh, my and so I actually credit you for a lot of uh, opening up that, you know, appreciation interest to that period in time. Um, oh, just you. just, uh, just to give you that credit w- that is rightly deserved for your content, mate. Um, and I, but I have to admit, I think my favorite video of yours is uh, is the bed video. So, oh, okay. You know, that, that's, yeah. that, that's, that's rarely at the, people's, at the top of people's well, list. Well, the reason why I love it, right, it shared such unique details that are rarely ever talked about and mentioned that would actually have been far more common and prominent in the time period and Mm -hmm. and it's those kind of details that i particularly love it's the ones that people don't really know yet in contrast that would have been so common and prominent um in the period that uh i i just i just eat up and so that video has always stood out to me as as one of my favorite another thing that that, oh uh, I would like to ask you, Lloyd, uh, mm-hmm. did you listen to uh, Band of Brothers? Did you watch Band of Brothers? Oh, yes. Yes. Great series. Because I, I think that's also a good example of uh, well-depicted World War II. Uh, absolutely. And that was uh, produced by a lot of the same people who worked on Saving Private Ryan. Uh, and, and and again, yeah, it shows uh, Steven Spielberg didn't direct much, but he was an executive producer um, and so he engaged a lot of the, the same people to make sure that things were right. It's, I, one thing I found a little bit odd is that there are a lot of very well-known British actors playing Americans in it. <laughs> and if you are British, you go, "Hang on, I know him. <laughs> I know him." So that they sort of whoop. They, they so like Simon Pegg is in it, for instance, uh, playing an American. And just I know that he's not an American, and that that's Simon Pegg. And that he's also, he dyes his hair blonde. And so when you see him playing a blonde American, it's, oh, it, it's a, so occasionally that, that you get those little jolts out of it. But yes, overall, very good. Very good. Although weirdly, the, the, the sequel series, Pacific, was it called? I didn't see that one. Um, yeah, that they, did, they did another series set in, uh, in the, 
on on the Pacific front, and it just didn't work. It's 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 strange, but it just didn't didn't have it. it. It's not easy to put your finger on it, but it's just it wasn't compelling in the same way. Um, yeah, I, I didn't even know there was a sequel series. So, um, well, there you go. It, it's sort of sank without trace. <laughs> yeah, it seems like that. Um, but hey, you were going to mention something about that bed video. Um, uh, so. Oh well, yeah. I mean, that was an example of of something that just spiraled out of control. Um, <laughs> it started from the fact that my sponsor handler said, "There's this mattress company who might sponsor you." I, I think they were my second sponsor or something. This was when I was really new to being sponsored. And I felt this great obligation to make things relevant. You know, why, why am I suddenly talking about beds in a, in a video about tanks? You know, that, that sort of jarring, whoop, and now I'm going to try and sell you a bed thing. Just, I just thought it was wrong. So I thought, well, how can I make this relevant? Okay, I'll do something about beds. And, and then, oh, God, I ended up making it in such a hurry. That cardboard suit of armor, I ended up making, I can remember I was making it at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, to get this flipping thing <laughs> finished, to, to get to the deadline, and um, uh, I just rambled. I just it ended up being like half an hour long or something, and that was a long that was a long video for me in those days. And I think <laughs> oh, I'll make a couple of points about video uh, about beds, and then it'll be fine. And then I thought, oh, well, I could just say this, and then uh, and <laughs> you have to edit your videos, right, Shad? So. You know, well, you, actually, I, I outsource them now, but um, I really, do yeah, oh. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, I save me a do, lot of time. I still edit everything, and so when I go on yet another digression, when it comes to the edit stage, you go, oh god, I got to check all these facts, and it keeps like <laughs> because when I go off on a digression, I'm you know I'm usually sort of right or close, but I do sometimes get an important detail wrong, uh, and. I, so I have to I have to post uh, fact check them in post and then I have to put in captions correcting myself, or maybe I'll mention something and then I think oh, I've got to show them a picture of it now. So I've got to find a, a picture of that thing and then I've got to source the copyright for it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, well, see, yeah, even though I outsource my editing, I still do that that exact thing where I'll quality control it afterwards. And oftentimes, I like if you the, if you see my videos where I'm I'm on camera and suddenly there's a break where I'm actually speaking in audio and there's pictures instead. That's when I felt like I interjected a clarification or I had cut something and replaced it to make it more accurate. And so I get that completely. That's a it's a common common thing that um that does arise when you're trying to be as accurate as you can. Because because you're, yeah. you're right. Like there are so many things that I have heard and learned like in casual research or even from some, you know, who someone, else, someone else who knows mentioned something that I hadn't double checked, but now it's logged away as a factoid that can come out when I'm just talking. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I should really double check that one just to make sure. Um, so I understand how that can happen, definitely. Uh, yes. And uh, I've, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I've saddled myself with the shtick of uh, doing videos in a single take. I <laughs> so That's... so that I can't stop. I can't stop to check the fact. I gotta keep going and then go. I hope that's right. I hope that's you right. You do that well, really well, by the way. The whole one take, um, uh, one take thing. It's like I just because I can't. I don't like writing a script because it would take too much time. And so I, I'm I'm of the jump cut camp, of course. But uh, right. that's but it impresses me that you stuck to it so well, actually. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, thank you. Uh, but on the other <laughs> hand, when you, we all hate watching and listening to ourselves, I imagine. Um, uh, when you hear your voice on the telephone, you're so disappointed. Oh, do I sound like that? Um, and when I think in my mind of what to say, I'm so articulate and I never say um or er. Uh, and I was. it took me years to get over the shock of how often I say um and er. Uh. It's a mm. lot. Yeah, they come out naturally, and um, that's see. I just did it then. I like. I guarantee I would be done doing it all thing, and that's actually why I generally do the jump cut things to cut out the pauses where because in natural speech patterns, when you're trying to think of the next thing to say, and suddenly your brain hits a oh, it's not really there yet. Your natural inclination is to fill the void. Is like ah, well, with it, and you'll pause, and so if we're, then he said, well, and, and your brain is saying ah, oh, there it is, and then you're ready to go again, and that's. 
generally I no what happens. I notice in my long video, if I talk for an hour, an hour and a half, something like that, there's usually somewhere around the two thirds of the way through mark where I can see I, it's really slowing down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I get embarrassed watching myself. I think, oh, this is a guy, because I know what's going on. This is a guy thinking, how do I get from here to the ending I was I was sort of aiming for, or, <laughs> or an ending of any sort that will be uh, be satisfying? Because I've I've gone off on so many tangents now. How do I get back? And I can sometimes see it in my eyes that my eyes will drift off camera a bit. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, how do I get back on track? So. <laughs> See, so, yeah. what happens with me, my editor gets these long pauses of me with this face on. And that's me writing the script in my head. It's like what to say next and stuff. Um, but uh, the fact that you do it while you're talking, mate, props. That's uh, <laughs> well done. Um, but so to round, round the stream off, probably mm -hmm. the worst adaptation I've ever seen to date. And uh, I... <laughs> And I need to caveat this because um, a, like a, a mate that I've uh, like I, I consider a friend now. I collaborated with Lars Anderson, you know the archery guy. Um, oh yes. He he actually helped out with this film in teaching the actors how to how to shoot the bow in a faster way. And so this isn't a dig against him, but the most recent Robin Hood film, like I, it is it is. I um, <laughs> so I haven't level. seen it. I saw the trailer. And I was genuinely wondering whether it was a spoof. Yeah, exactly. It is it was, next it, level when it comes to how bad it is. It's it's wow. There was another. There was a King Arthur film. That was it. Guy Ritchie directed. Yeah, I think it was Guy Ritchie. Oh yeah, that's that's up there as well. Like, again, I haven't seen it, but apparently, what they were going to do was remake Excalibur, and then they got a bit sidelined. Oh my goodness, we've lost uh, Dylan temporarily, but I'm sure he'll yeah, be back. Um, oh, there he is. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, that King Arthur one, yeah, it was bad. But I tell you what, this new Robin Hood one, oh boy, it, it, it is it is the crowning. Well, like, this is this is good because if they're lowering the bar for, for medieval fantasy, uh, Shadow of the Conqueror could just step over it. It's, it's hopefully, because I mean, I... I'll just ex explain with the one scene, the opening scene, where he's supposedly on a crusade, and the, the what they're wearing is just unbelievable. I can't express how bad it is. But there's this guy who's got a ballista, right, and he starts shooting out arrows like they've been shot from a cannon, and they are hitting walls and making walls explode, and it's rapid fire. And I'm like watching this guy. Oh, like, I think I did a spit take when I tried watching this film just like what <laughs> it was amazing but i don't i don't know that audiences like that i don't i, I the I, I i i yeah i i when people saw saving private ryan they 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 were awed by it they they thought wow wow yeah that's how you do a world war ii movie yeah yeah, I agree. And like, and that's why I was impressed with Outlaw King is because in regards to, like you compare it to something like Braveheart, it's almost night and day with mm. the extra effort they put in to actually, uh, now it's not perfect, but they did so much better. Like, my goodness, they're actually wearing coats of plates and, you know, like, mm. um, so it was a really good step in the right direction. And when you contrast something like that, where things are improving, or something like that Robin Hood movie, where it's just like, I have no idea what happened. It is uh, because the adaptate, the medieval elements are beyond the pale with how bad they are. But then the whole movie itself is so bad. And again, this isn't, I'm not attacking you, Lars. I reckon Lars did a great job and there's a great guy in terms of um, teaching people archery and everything. Uh, um, but that film, wow. Wow. My gosh. <laughs> oh. I, I, I think I need to make a video on that, how bad that movie is. And just because <laughs> I've actually got a big pile of DVDs over there, which includes several DVDs of films I know to be bad, which I, <laughs> I, I could just rip them apart. Um, unfortunately, the, the videos doing that take an awful long time to make. And then you get hit with a copyright strike and you earn nothing. So. I know. Uh, I, 
I mean, I found certain techniques that do help out, like keeping clips shorter and things, um, and to trying to just weave through. But it's it's a maze, or a minefield, in fact. Um, where and uh, I admit, like when I first did it, I got hit heavy with copyright things. And it's the, the studio, the studios, are, they have different standards. If you do anything done by Lionsgate, they are the biggest. They will they will flag anything. Um, right. So Lionsgate is terrible, and Netflix, they seem to be pr pretty good, actually. But anyway, I won't go off on that tangent. But um, th I, I think, you know, we've had a great conversation, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's rounding off, so I think it's time to to uh, to uh, lead us off into uh, the, uh, the conclusion. And I will okay. just uh, begin by saying thank you to everyone who has joined us, especially thank you to Lloyd, a special guest here, which has been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, truly, our pleasure, in fact. Um, and thank you, everyone who is, uh, you know, excited for the short film as well. And uh, and if you are interested in donating, any donation would be vastly appreciated. And we thank everyone who has helped out. There'll be links in the description as well. Um, but this has been it. This has been a very special episode of the Everfans show, and it will be on Shadowversity as well. Um, right, in edited form, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I might do a, a super cut off, but though things have flown pretty darn well in this well, whole can, thing. Well, can I just make a request that whenever yeah. that lady walks behind Dylan, can you add the um, the, the the sixth sense, the sixth sense jump scare noise? <laughs> 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 I'll see what I can do. Uh, okay. so, how much energy I have, do, but, it might want... be, uh, but that's kind of it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It has been a, a pleasure as always, and of course, we hope to see you again. Um, um, I just want to plug the yeah, to, to Thursday's live stream. So we have another live stream for the end of the Kickstarter, where uh, m a lot of people from our team will be. Uh, coming into the stream and answering your questions. Uh, it's going to be a very long live stream where you can come in whenever and it's going to end at the same time as the Kickstarter ends. So you're all invited to come. Uh, back to you, Shad. <laughs> awesome. But that's it. Thank you guys for watching and uh, we will now bid you a fond farewell. Um, any, any last words that you'd like to mention, Lloyd? You don't have to, but... Uh... <laughs> Scaffolding, archipelago, truncheon, soil. Wise words. We shall Thank take you. them to heart. Thank you. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Farewell.